have one there, isn't it? I don't have one there. I don't know if we know some it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. It's not going to get me going anyway. Okay. <coughs> okay, members, you're all very welcome. Um, the just to remind members that the sensitivity of your microphones um, can pick up conversations. So just to be mindful. That. Um, today's meeting, we will have officials from the department to brief the committee on waiting lists, and then we will also have a briefing on the children, children's social care services. Um, and we have about an hour on each session. So, as we've said before, if we can try and keep it, keep our questions brief within that five seven minutes for each, and then with, with time at the end, we can come back. Not to not to constrain people, but just so everybody gets a an opportunity. Um, so now just to uh, declare the meeting is open to the public. Um, <coughs> members of the committee meeting will be recorded and broad broadcast through Parliament buildings and online. And just to remind members and those in the public gallery that they're welcome to use, you're welcome to use mobile devices as long as they're in airplane mode and all devices are muted. Um, and you can connect to the Assembly Wi-Fi but not permitted to take photographs or record any of the meeting. Um, so the first item on the agenda is apologies. Clark. Yes, Colin has sent his apologies, but he may be able to join us for part of the meeting remotely. Okay, we'll, we'll keep a wee eye out for that as well. Okay, um, I have no chairperson's business this week, members, so we'll go to item three, the draft minutes, which are from the meeting on the 14th of March and are at tab three, page six of the meeting pack. Are members content with the minutes as drafted? And, yeah, thank you. Um, <coughs> matters arising then at number four at tab four page three of the table pack is a copy of the tobacco and vapes bill which was um, published in Westminster yesterday and we should expect that the LCM will be laid in the common days um, the clerk will schedule briefings from the department and stakeholders for after the Easter recess as we will have a limited time period um, to consider and then and to, to uh, agree a report coming out of that. So we will um I'll follow on from the brief from last week. I know members will be very interested in that. Um, item number five then, um, we are going to go straight to the briefing from the Department for Health on waiting lists and just your uh, in your pack members it's at tab five. No just just yep. <coughs> You're very welcome. Um, so we have to Thomas Adele, uh, Director of Elective Care and Cancer Policy Directorate, and Lisa McWilliams, who is the Director of Performance, Strategic Planning and Performance Group. So you're both very welcome. Thank you for coming today. Um, so happy for you to, to start. Thank, thank you very much. Um, you okay for doing an opening? Yes, opening yes absolutely. So good afternoon. It's, it's great to be here again. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to, to provide a briefing on the waiting times. So I'm Thomas Adel, and with Miss Lisa. To, in the interest of time, we have decided to want to one joint opening statement that I will do. It's a short um, statement to provide some further details on the briefing paper we provided to you, and I'm hoping you found that useful. As I'm sure you're aware, reducing waiting times is a key priority for the Department of Health, and something that we uh, are passionate about. And I would like to outline some of the key elements of that work today. But before I do so, I would give, want to give you some context in the position we're in. You, you will all have seen the stats and publications on waiting times. They are unacceptably long, um, some of the worst in Europe. At the end of December uh, last year, across four <coughs> trusts, there were th about 340,000 patients <coughs> waiting for a first consultant-led outpatient appointment. That's an increase of 1% in the previous quarter, and almost a 10% increase on the 12 months uh, prior to that. In the same period, about 154,000 patients waiting for diagnostic tests in uh, four trusts, and some 97,000 patients waiting for inpatient day case admission to hospital. And just for clarity, it's four trusts as South Asian Trust are implementing a new data system, meaning we don't have the same available information at this point. Um, tackling these waiting times is not going to be quick. It's not, there's no quick fix, there's no one big bang solution that will do that all in one go. It will require sustainable and recurrent investment, workforce development, and system-wide transformation. The Electric Care Framework, which was published in June 21, provides a policy structure of what's required. 
we know we need to transform our system. We know we need to become more efficient and effective. And we know what we need to do to get to that point. This includes reform and innovation in areas such as treatment capacity, outpatient reform, imaging and pathology, workforce and protection of elective care from unscheduled care pressures. However, as we're all aware, we're operating in extreme financial pressure. Despite this, it must be noted that much good work has already happened and is continuing to happen in the transformation of our service. So, for, for example, elective capacity has been enhanced through continued development of elective care centres. There is two rapid diagnosis centres in both White Abbey and South Rhone hospitals. There is a regional stone service at Krugavon Area Hospital. We have mega clinics to introduce uh, to maximise patient throughput. Just some, uh, some examples. We have carried out service reviews of general surgery, orthopaedics, urology and gynaecology. <coughs> and we are also doing, a doing a review in paediatrics, orthopaedics. And we are planning to do a review in ear, nose and throat, so ENT, in the next short while. These are particular specialties with particular concerns. As I've already indicated, the scale of the problem is significant, but a transform transformative work and recurrent investment would go a long way to address some of the core issues within the system. It is essentially, what we're doing will fix most of the ongoing demand capacity issues for, for what we need to do. And the work that it has delivered results. Um, our focus has been on treatments rather than diagnostics and outpatients. Couldn't we start the end, otherwise we're just creating more lists by fixing the, the start. So in the last 12 months, our inpatient day case admission treatment waiting lists have been reduced by 12%. Th that's a significant reduction. And it's been six quarters in a row with reduction. That's the longest continued reduction since at least 2008. Our longest lists, so general surgery and orthopedics, have reduced by 20% and 7% respectively um, in the 12 months between December 22 and December 23. This is good news and it must be celebrated. That has happened through dedication of healthcare professionals and through the transformation of those services. However, the overall waiting time is still not acceptable. So while those waits have reduced, the, the waits are too long. We must do more. Implementation of the elective care framework is continuing and, of, and we are currently reviewing the framework to ensure that it takes account of changes within the system over the last three years and we're hoping to produce or we will produce an updated version by the end of June. We're also working with trust to increase productivity and efficiency through the use of um, best practice service improvement guidance. This will help us address the core capacity demand gap. However, the backlog must still be addressed. The backlog is a huge problem. Short-term um, non-recurrent investment through waiting list initiatives will help us provide additional capacity to deal with backlog. Um, this is for both within the HSC and outside the HSC in the independent sector. Historically, non-recurrent funding has been used to tackle the, length, these length, uh, the, the waiting lists. However, in recent years, about 80% of the spend in this financial year, about 100% of the spend, has been for red flags for cancer patients and time-critical patients, with only the remaining for true waiting lists. Therefore, um, our Minister's put it to executive that minimum funding of approximately 75 to 80 million per year would be needed to ensure that those with cancer or time-critical con conditions can be treated. That is essentially to plug the demand capacity gap for time critical and, and um, cancer patients. That is not true waiting list work. That is purely to make sure those patients who require treatment will receive treatment. Funds above the 75 to 80 million uh, required for those patients can be used to address the waiting lists. So true waiting list work, if you want to put it that way. At, at our current projections, we believe it's possible to spend up to about £135 million pounds per year, non-recurrent, to address waiting lists in addition to the red flag and time critical patients. Um, and the amount of spend will have a direct impact on the reduction in waiting times. However, even if we got £135 million pounds per year for the next few years, we will not be able to remove all waits. Our waiting lists are so extreme that it's impossible to completely remove them, whatever we do, in, in the short term. It is a long-term project and it requires long-term planning. Longer-term investment will also allow us to ensure better value for money by creating long-term contracts and more sustainable investments. They will also allow appropriate workforce planning and contracts with an independent sector that are um, that spans a number of years. This will allow us to um, invest in a sustainable way. Long-term recurrent sustainable, sustainable financial investment in core capacity 
will also help us to allow transformation in the system to help reduce demand, providing a more cost-effective way to reduce weights and to prevent, prevent build-up of weights in the future. I mean, in, in short, it's not much help with fixing the weightlessness now if we don't do anything to fix the sustainable service. That's a short outline of our position. So again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here today, and I'm ha we're happy to take any questions you have for us. Uh, thank you. Uh, Thomas, that's been very helpful. Um, and I know we'll have a, a number of <coughs> questions because this is obviously a, a, a key issue, um, and I think it's an executive priority as well. So, um, and we did have a motion in, in the Assembly a number of weeks ago in relation to this. So it's, it's something we're all acutely aware of. Um, I have a couple of questions, and then I'll open up to, to members. Um, I suppose, firstly, you've, you've mentioned the 135 million um, that is that is needed, uh, and you've said there very clearly that even with that, it would be very difficult to bring waiting lists down, which um, is is obviously concerning as well. So I suppose, and I, we have raised this with the minister too. We we need to be looking at how what what else, other options are available to us to try and reduce waiting lists while also trying to do the transformational change that's required. And one of the, the uh, schemes that we have been able to use in the past is the cross-border directive, which was previously the EU directive um, prior to Brexit. And from my experience from dealing with constituents, um, this has been a very successful um, initiative because it has enabled people to come out, come off the waiting list to get their surgery and to live uh, have, you know, bit with better outcomes. Because what we're finding is at the minute people are on the waiting list and the longer they're on, then by the time they're actually getting seen, they probably need, maybe if it's a hip, they maybe need the other one done then by that stage. So it's actually putting additional pressure on our health service overall. Um, so I, we have raised this with the Minister, but is this something the Department are considering? Because I'm very conscious the template's there. We've had it done before. It's worked really well. It's accessible to, to a, a wide range of people. I know certainly my office and I'm sure other MLAs will be able to uh, say the same, is inundated with people asking, is it reopening? Because they probably have surgery booked sometimes and it would be very useful. I think it would help to take people out of the waiting list, but also um, and, and help to bring that down to maybe a more uh, manageable level for us to then do the, the real work that needs to happen. So, I mean, the simple answer is we're willing to do anything we can to reduce <laughs> waiting list if we have funds available to, to allow that to happen. So having a equivalent to the Republic of Ireland Rebirthment Scheme would require funding, uh, obviously. If we received funding, th that would be something we consider. We want to think how we can get the best use of that money, and that would mean considering if it should be open up wider than just Republic of Ireland. Maybe it should be all of Europe, and um, maybe um, GB. Basically, if we can have capacity to reduce a waiting list, we should use any capacity available to us. We must also think about which patients are best suited for that kind of scheme. Mm -hmm. So there might be that we would th consider limits on people who are waiting X number of time on the waiting list before they can qualify for that scheme. But in, any of those things would have to be worked out in when we know if we have money and how much money we have available. Yeah. Um, but it's not off the table. That's something we were very much part of our overall planning. Yeah, well, that, that's certainly good to hear. Um, <laughs> take your point that about opening it up wider. Obviously, we did have the EU directive in place. Um, before and and that was had, had worked well as well. In terms of funding, is is there a figure on? I know in the past, the when the, in the last mandate, the minister put um, I think it was five million in before it closed, and then once that that funding ran out, it, the scheme closed. Is there a figure at present for how much would be needed to try and tackle, um, you know, some of the people, some of the issues that we are seeing? So. The money invested in the last scheme indicates yeah. roughly how much money can be invested in that scheme, yeah. how much capacity is available for that kind of patients in, in, in the South. Mm -hmm. If the scheme is opened wider, more money could in theory be used. Mm -hmm. We should, there is one, when you think about how the best value of money overall investment is, so if we get a limited amount of money for waiting list, this might not be the best value for money in overall. Um, so we must consider the overall picture. If you get 135 million, as, we're, as we obviously want, yeah. We would certainly would consider a fairly wide scheme for reimbursement. Um, and the only thing I would add to that is there is an equity uh, issue with any of those schemes mm -hmm. because you know travel and the difference between uh, NHS tariff has to be paid for by the individual. Mm -hmm. So that, that's where there is an equity issue, um, and that's where there is a consideration about value for money and what is best for. Um, everybody, regardless of whether they can actually afford it to actually go privately. So that's where Tomas is saying, you know, 
we will have a suite of, of options um, for, the, uh, for any allocation. Uh, and then there'll be a process of what is value for money, what's the, uh, where do we get our biggest gain, uh, what impact can it make, because uh, depending on the size of money, you could target um, you know, long waders. You know, if it's a small amount of money, you would target long waders, but you probably wouldn't see a big difference if it was mm. a small amount of money and spread across every specialty, whereas you may, uh, and in the past we have targeted the particularly long waiting uh, patients, which are in a, you know, the top five specialties, and actually really made a difference to take weights, yeah. which in the past were nine years. You know, we're not celebrating the fact that we have moved uh, down um, quite substantially. Down, well, substantially, we have still some waiters in the uh, seven years, but we have are moving in the right direction. So it's about what would that funding enable us to do? What are the tools? Um, and it is about thinking about doing things differently. Um, mm -hmm. So the expansion of an ROI scheme to a wider scheme would be one example. But it's also, as Tomas has alluded to, uh, if we entered into slightly longer term contracts or if we had slightly long longer term contracts for insourcing, which is cheaper than sending patients directly out to the IS. Uh, but if you had a longer term contract or a bigger value contract, you can get a you know, the negotiation on cost. Mm -hmm is better and then we can get more patients because ultimately we want more patients seen, uh, diagnosed and treated um, and, and you know, we have to work out what the smartest thing is. Yeah, no, and I, I take your point, Lisa. I mean, we obviously wouldn't want to be seeing a position where we're, we're focusing on, on, on using the independent sector because we, ideally we don't want to be in that position at all. Um, <coughs> but I suppose given the situation and, and knowing the impact on patients who are suffering in the meantime, if there's something we can do. And, and as you've alluded to, the cross-border scheme and another, I suppose that, that wider piece isn't going to suit everyone. Um, because not everybody can, you know, could maybe afford to access it or can travel or whatever the reason may be. But if there's people there who are willing to, who want to, to do that, then and we can help to support that. I think it would help to to reduce the weight list down a bit and help us to get to the core of, our, of what we need to do. Um, I suppose just moving on then, and obviously there is a big focus on the kind of orthopaedics and and the elective care. It, and we have an elective care hub recently opened in my own area in Daisy Hill. What sort of impact are you seeing from, from those hubs opening? Um, I know the Trust had quoted us at, the, at our meeting with the Chief Executives. I think there was 6,000 uh, elective care uh, procedures carried out already at the Daisy Hill one. So just are we seeing that really taken down the wait list? Is it working well? Um, or can we, can we comment on that at this stage? And if I start, Tomas will, um, and if we take some of the examples, so, and you started with orthopaedics, so one of the investments has been in the Duke of Connaught unit in Musgrave Park Hospital, which is for day case. Um, so high volume but low complexity, so carpal tunnels, um, largely hand procedures. Um, so it has um, seen 1,700 day cases and 750 outpatients, so we are starting to see, and the reason we have those is they are protected from the unscheduled care pressures. Um, urology, we have seen a urology, we have investments in uh, Craig Avon, um, as Tomas has indicated, but we also have urology investments in our OMA um, uh, facility uh, through the Western Trust. So the uh, outpatient weights for urology in the region are down 9.5% and the inpatient is down 9.6%. So we are starting to see inroads. Uh, likewise, we have Lagan Valley. Um, and our other uh, day procedure centres doing urgent scopes and the urgent scopes, uh, scopes we've seen a 10% reduction in people waiting. So that's the 6,000 that the chief executives mentioned to you. That's purely for urgent scopes. Um, and then there, Tomas has indicated, we are seeing inroads in the orthopaedics and general surgery weights. Uh, ENT treatment weights are down just over 15%. Um, and cataract would be another high volume. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, and we all know the impact of, of cataracts and the longer you wait for cataracts and then it's the more complicated procedure you have. Uh, so we have seen in, in cataracts, um, you know, when we went into COVID, there were five and a half thousand people waiting for a cataract. Um, as of January, we have that down to 2,900. Um, but I suppose when you look at the long waiting patients for cataracts, we had 3,615 waiting more than a year uh, in March 21, and we have 184. Um, as of the end of January. So we are starting through, uh, and we do cataracts in uh, three of our elective hubs, as well as the Royal, the Matter, um, 
So we are starting to see that activity um, and there's more to be done mm -hmm. uh, and we still want to drive the productivity and efficiency of all of those um, and we are still impacted by uh, do not attend and cancellation rates in all of our facilities uh, but we feel it more in our day procedure uh, centres, you know, our dedicated elective. Uh, so we are working on text reminders, we are looking at um, mega clinics which traditionally have been uh, assessment clinics for me, you know for orthopedics and a couple of specialties but we've been looking at pre-op assessment mega clinics so actually taking a, a, you know 100 patients with a group of anaesthetists and surgeons to actually one identify are you know do you still require the procedure are you suitable for the procedure would you be suitable for uh, a day procedure so therefore you would go to the dpcs would you be suitable for you know, a single night maximum elective overnight stay, then you would go to our elective overnight stay centres. Uh, and actually that is really making sure that the case mix is in the right place. Mm -hmm. And it's really, um, we are starting, we've only, we've only had four of those mega clinics, but we are starting to see a really good allocation. And the hope of that is that uh, it's another opportunity to um, make sure that people are going to come for their procedures because we still have quite a lot of DNAs on the day, despite trusts indicating we spoke to that patient yesterday and they were still mm -hmm. coming. Now, people will always have something you know, unexceptional, you know, something unexpected happening, mm -hmm. but some of the numbers mean that that's um, a waste of slots. So the benefit of the pre-op assessment mega clinics is you have a cohort of people who have already been worked up and you can quickly see, could you come in today? I know you, you, know, you weren't expecting it, but we have a slot, could you come in? And we're trying to therefore make sure that we're not losing those precious slots because you know, theatres are our most expensive resource mm -hmm. um, and we have a significant quantum of patients waiting. Yeah, no, and that's great to hear and especially when you can sort of start to um, show the, 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 the impact that's having. See, and just in relation to the staff and I mean, certainly one of the things we've seen in, in recent years is that surgical staff in particular is, have been, it's been very difficult to recruit. Are you seeing any kind of um, upward trend now that it's, it's, it's becoming more attractive, that people are want, because of the elective hubs um, and people are able to do the specialties and things like that? Is that something that we're seeing a benefit of? Absolutely. I mean, there's a significant difference, especially theatre nursing. Mm -hmm. so theatre nursing is quite a small group of people, actually, yeah. in Northern Ireland, because it's... Um, while we employ many nurses, we don't actually have that many theatres in a big scheme of things. Um, and when theatre nursing, especially during COVID, were asked to do other things, they left. Mm -hmm. Now when they're doing what they want to do, which is being in theatres, they stay. Yeah. So And, and it, it's, it's very clear where, I um, mean, Daisy Hill, for example, as you mentioned, Daisy Hill uh, has had difficulties with theatre nursing for a long time. It, recruitment has become much easier, much easier to retain staff when they're doing elective overnight stay patients mm -hmm. because it's the kind of patients they expect to do. They get good at the job and they get good job satisfaction. I mean, it, it's true in any job. Yeah. If people are happy, they stay. Yeah. And it's, it's, we can really see that in theatres. Um, yeah. so, so while there's still massive staffing challenges, those issues are less than it used to be. Okay. And if I could just quantify that, if it's helpful. Um, <coughs> we, we absolutely had an impact on, uh, on staff being available to, to actually staff our theatre lists. Um, you know, and we had you know, a period of time with very little theatre activity during COVID. And then when we moved into the post-COVID phase, we probably were doing 300 theatre lists a week. Um, as of two weeks ago, we'd reached 704, which is in the, you know, it's not far off where we would have been in our ideal. Uh, now, there is some flex in that because we are also refurbing theatres. Mm -hmm. So we, on any one day, you might lose 10 uh, to get 10 back uh, in later stages. But that just shows that that, you know, that particular theatre nursing, the whole multidisciplinary team that work in theatres, um, has stabilised and, you know, and 704 lists in a week is good. Mm -hmm. um, we want to make sure that every one of those lists starts and it starts on time, finishes when it's supposed to finish, and no uh, uh, early finishes, and that actually is as efi efficient and productive. So that's a whole. We have an, an entire efficiency productivity module for elective, um, and a number of them are focusing on theatres. But Tomas alluded to outpatient modernisation. So we, you know, go straight to tests as opposed to wait a long time to come to assessment to be booked for the tests that you were always going to have. Um, or even uh, through our advanced clinical triage, being very clear, actually, no, this is the wrong specialty. 
uh, or we would require further information before you would come to outpatient, so let's get that arranged. Uh, and then the patient-initiated follow-up is another way of actually saying only see patients post-treatment that actually need to be seen um, and actually <coughs> enable patients to actually indicate uh, when something hasn't gone as they would maybe understand or they've got a query. So we, we <coughs> a number of years ago, introduced that for cancer patients. So arguably some of our more, um, you know, uh, urgent patients, we did have that self-directed aftercare for breast cancer patients. We haven't done it for our surgical patients who are in the routine urgent. Um, and actually it's saying what tools do we need to give and how do we as a system have a patient-initiated follow-up, which is, you'll hear PIFU being mentioned. So um, we're learning from England, Scotland and Wales so that we're not reinventing the wheel. So we're taking the good bits and the things that don't work to actually say, what does our programme mean? So you would then require less review appointments, which enables you to have more new appointments for assessment, but actually only those people who need that first appointment get that first appointment. So it's a whole mix of, uh, of working really smartly and using the whole multidisciplinary team because it's not always a consultant that you need to see. It may be more appropriate that you see uh, a physio uh, or a, a nurse for some of those component parts. Uh, my last question is just in relation to the 135 million then. And um, <coughs> we, we've been trying to get a wee bit of detail of what that is actually, you know, what that means in... in, in um, an implementation if that was received. I mean, can you can you give us a sense of what the priorities for the hundred and thirty five million would be and if it is um allocated, what sort of impact do we think it'll have on the waiting lists? So uh, absolutely the, the first caveat I want to say is when we the timing on when we would receive money will depend on what we can do with the money. Mm -hmm. And how short or long term it is will make a big difference. Well if we get hundred and thirty five million in one year um, the kind of interventions we can do is different than if you get 135 million for a number of years or even spread over a number of years. Um, so, so it's hard to answer the question with exact detail mm -hmm. because there's so many variables. But 135 million would, would uh, allow us to do approximately 76,000 outpatient appointments, 14,000 day case procedures and over 9,000 treatments and associated diagnostics with that. Mm -hmm. So the number of patients who can go through the system is, is quite, quite high. Um, I mean, at least I can give some examples of what it would cost to do certain interventions, mm -hmm. because then it becomes a choice to be spread ourselves yeah. thin across many places, yeah. to reduce the longest waiters, to focus on some specialities, um, or, or how do we spend the money? That, that's options, and all options are valid options, and it depends on if you get it in one year or many years or when in the time of year <coughs> we get it. Yeah, and I suppose, and we've looked at options, I suppose in the first instance, looking at the top five uh, longest waiters and volume waiters for both assessment and treatment. Uh, so dermatology would certainly have a significant backlog of assessment weights, but to simply target and allocate funding for the four-year waiters for dermatology is three million alone. And that's only the four-year waiters, that's not the rest. Um, cataracts uh, we have looked at um, to actually close that cataract backlog down is five million in itself so that's uh, the uh, balance for the cataract hips and knees to get anyone waiting over two years for hips and knees cleared is 30 million and uh, if you only did four four year waiters it's still 17 million for uh, hips and knees uh, lap colis, <coughs> which are the laparoscopic cholecystectomies, um, so one of the general surgery, to do four-year waders, because there's a thousand of those, is nearly five million. So we have an entire suite. And then if I just touch on paediatrics, because tonsillectomies mm -hmm. is a, is a, a large weight for uh, paediatrics, just to target the four-year waders uh, is 3.5. But arguably, with paediatrics, you want to have the window for less impact on those children who are developing. Um, and they have a slightly different, um, so you would probably want to target much more than the four-year waiters for tonsillectomies. Um, so we have started looking at what are the numbers, what would be feasible, how do we, what, what would be the biggest <coughs> impact? Um, and then, you know, ideally, it, you, for value for money, it is in-house additionality, so it's your evening and weekend uh, clinics using our own staff. 
Um, but you've got to be conscious that you know staff only want so much overtime to do that. Um, so then the next value for money is your insourcing, where your IS provider comes in uh, and use the facilities, and that's better value for money. And then you've got the IS, so sending direct sends out, sending patients out, and you can send patients out for treatment, or you send them out for the full workup. Um, and, and there's always a there's always a balance because the more money we spend in the independent sector, the more is a pull from our HSC mm -hmm. staff yeah. to lift, to staff those lists, which is why the you know other conversations are not even in the context of an ROI scheme, but are there other um, UK wide schemes and services sorry services rather than schemes that actually it would make sense for particular cohorts to see if we can buy it from the NHS now that means that patients are travelling, they are they were staying away from their family, so there is cost, costs, societal costs to that, as well as financial costs, but actually, you know, depending on the scale of money, I, I think what Tom, Tomas and I have been very clear, uh, and we have uh, discussed it with the Minister, is we would look to see what, what, what can we do, even if it's slightly out of the box, because then you need to just rule it out, because it's not logistical, or, uh, and any of these things, we will test it with cohorts of service users to see you know, would anybody even be interested in going to you know a scheme in Wales if we had an arrangement for X number of procedures? Would people actually want to go? And um, so that's why we <coughs> don't have a set menu because we we will flex it to the amount of funds available, yeah. uh, and whether it's one year or whether we're rolling it across. Yeah, I suppose just the only the only one that I didn't hear is around red cancer <laughs> referrals, red flag cancer referrals, which obviously is operating on a downward trajectory in terms of uh, you know getting into the target times I mean breast cancer referrals were generally within two weeks and I know it, the last I heard it was 10 to 12 weeks so is that factored in within that 135 million or is that separate so we 135 million it would be the what we call the true waiting list work so people are waiting and waiting list now okay in what previous waiting list initiative money we spent about 70 to 80 million pounds on Time critical cancer and time critical patients, so they include breast cancer patients or any red flag pathways. We would need that in additionality before we can spend on the waiting list. Okay. So 135 million is in addition to the pre what we estimated of 75 to 80 million pound non recurrent to just stand still on time critical and cancer. Okay. So that, that's. Um, and, we, and we would never traditionally have spent any WLI money on cancer and time critical because it was always just having to be done. But with our. You know, we had weights before COVID, then we've had the impact of COVID. The, the gap between the capacity demand and the backlog means that those patients are, would wait too long. So we've had to, with our clinical teams working with the trust, we've had to identify, actually, we're going to need to, we, we need to buy this through additionality because we can't let these individuals miss a treatment opportunity. They've had surgery. They have to have their chemo or their radiotherapy within this window. We have to keep that and the time critical patients are the same. So we would never um, have used that through WLI money, but because we have spent that money, it has, has meant that their treatment's quicker. But when you look at our waiting times, you're not seeing yeah. the impact because the people who are waiting and who are waiting the longest are our routine, but actually now also some of our urgents because they're not time critical or cancer. So those patients wait longer. Um, and then the longer people wait in those uh, categories, um, we actually also then start seeing, uh, you know, what would have normally been a routine patient maybe being referred in as an urgent or an urgent patient being referred in as a red flag to see does that speed up the journey. Um, so, you know, we have to work through it all, but we have said the time critical in cancer needs to be looked at separately. We need to shore that up uh, and actually true waiting money uh, will target those seven-year waiters, the five-year waiters, the four or the three, we need to start making inroads because those patients are just waiting and waiting and waiting, uh, and some of them are deteriorating and deconditioning. Yeah, no, and you mentioned dermatology. I spoke to a lady recently who got a phone call from dermatology eight years after her. She, she couldn't even remember what it was about. It was that long. That's the truth. Thank you very much. Sorry, Linda. Thank you, Chair, and <coughs> thank you for the presentation. I suppose a, a couple of things, just on the, on the back of what you've just said around the the red flags and obviously then the knock-on effect of using the, the waiting list money. I think we also need to remind ourselves that many people who are not red flagged 
may potentially have a serious diagnosis that is not just impeding their quality of life, but actually it could be discovered just because they're not red flag doesn't mean they don't have <coughs> cancer or they don't have any other life threatening um, illness. So I think we just need to remember that th- those people potentially will die as a result of, of not being red flagged in the first place. So there, there is, a, there is a, a difficult one for us to, I suppose, um, just on the back of what Chair, just on, on what you said, if it's okay on the the red flag breast and the waiting times on, on those have, and I asked this of, of the Southern Trust because that's my one of my trust areas and had a specific um, number of inquiries. But at that time, the <coughs> Southern Trust were able to refer where they weren't able to cope or didn't have the capacity, were able to refer under the Belfast Trust. Now, the difficulty is when they referred, if they'd been with the Southern Trust for five weeks, when they were referred into the Belfast Trust, they started from week one. That shouldn't have happened. Mm-hmm. And I think that that is something that needs to be addressed. I haven't actually, I mean, Southern Trust have come back to me on that, but what they're telling me is once it's referred into Belfast, what they don't have any control, that's, that shouldn't be the case. You know, it, it, yeah. it cannot be the case that we don't have any control. We're using that service, but we don't have any control. So I just want to, to get some reassurances around that. If you have waited for five weeks, when you go to the next trust, if, they, if you're using capacity in that trust, you're starting from week six, not week one. That's the first thing. Um, and the second thing in, is then that the Belfast Trust apparently has no capacity now to help out the Southern Trust. So what does that mean? What does that mean for, for patients in the Southern Trust? There might, be, there might be a simple answer to that. Maybe Southern Trust are, are yeah. back on track. But I just want to clarify. And my last question, I have loads of questions, to be honest. But I know everybody else has as well. So I'm not going to I'm not gonna hog people's time. But my last question, just at this point, is in your um, in the papers, you've said about you know going forward about that uh, the use or the hope to expand specialist nurses. If you can't give me the detail on that today, I would like to know specialist nurses and what because there are so many areas that that we would absolutely need specialist nurses, whether it be you know, and obviously I have a specific interest around women's health, but also rural you know ruralness is where people are very often neglected because they are the the one or two out there that are, but particularly around endometriosis, menopause clinics, you know, and and going forward, has that been looked at as part of the the women's health strategy, those those specialist nurses? So I'm going to, I think that's enough to give you for now. If I miss something, please please correct me. But on on the last point, I I think it would be right too, if that's okay, on the specialist nurses. I mean, that's that's, that's perfectly On on generically, because I mean, we, we need to use our workforce smarter. And I think everyone accepts that, that traditionally we are have overlance on doctors, and that's not healthy for doctors, but it's not healthy for anyone else either. We, we need to have others, that include nurses, but inclu- also includes uh, other um, professions, so physios and uh, other, other health professionals, to make sure that we get the best patient, the best MDT mix, so the best patient, they can see the patient, sees the patient. Th- that's how we get the best out of our system. Um, but we can write you on details because there are many good examples. And if I try to mm-hmm. make, set them now, I'll probably get mixed them up, which wouldn't be helpful. But th- that's absolutely part of our plans. So you can give me that assurance. When it comes to breast services as a whole, and, and I think you can speak about the equalization of breast weights, we, breast assessment services are under significant pressures. And the 14 day breast target in cancer is, the, the uh, stats are shocking. There's, there's just no other way to put that. Um, and I mean, I'm, sure, I'm sure you've seen it as well, but the, the overall Fortin breast target in September last year was 53%. That's, and the target is 100%, and that, that's just not good enough. Um, and the range varies massively, so the Southern Trust was at 8%, whereas Western Trust was at 100%. And that, that's not right. Um, we, I think we all accept that we rather have, it, it should be equal access, it shouldn't be based on which trust you live in. So we are doing wider reform transformation uh, work in breast services to figure out how we can get the best outcome for this. That is work we're progressing at pace um, and th- they'll be looking at how we can as a concept of patient care regionalize the service. Not saying that there will be one site, that's not what I'm saying, but that the patient is seen as one collective patient. It, it's, it's, one, it, it's not one trust problem that goes wrong, it's a, our system's problem when it goes wrong. So therefore, how can we respond as one system to make sure the patient gets access quickly? Um, so, so I can give you that assurance that we, we're working on that at the moment. 
um, you have to give us a little bit of time, not, I'm not saying many, many months, but at, at least a number of weeks to, to have um, worked out proposals and thoughts what this would look like. But we, we're working on that currently. And you can really speak on equalisation of... Yeah, and just picking up your, your first question, you know, the clock is not reset when a patient transfers, should never be reset when a patient transfers. So um, I, I will pick that up. I thought the answer had come back to, to provide assurance that that isn't the case, because that would be outside our rules, because you can't... Uh, that patient should be on week six, if you're describing it as five, and then transferring over. So um, we will have a look at that. Um, with regards to, and, and you've mentioned Southern Trust in particular, so Southern Trust had, um, has, had a, has had a couple of different issues with workforce. So they had a consultant radiology issue and then they had a surgeon um, shortage. Um, we, the Southern Trust um, have a new surgeon starting um, at the end of this month. So um, through the department, we actually were able to shore up funding to actually move the whole time equivalent surgical uh, funding for breast and Southern Trust to three, uh, and they were very lucky in their last recruitment, so they have have filled two spaces. So they will be back to three uh, full time consultants. Uh, they were previously had funding for about two point three, so they they actually will have three surgeons uh, with them. Um, and this is a surgeon that one of the surgeons is from outside of the UK, so this is new to Northern Ireland. And I suppose the reason we topped up the funding to enable that was because we viewed this as an NI resource to actually shore up. Um, uh, shore up breast services and actually Southern Trust performance is actually recovering really well uh, what we're doing at the moment is we are supporting the South Eastern Trust recovery with their breast 14 days as a consequence of embedding the linear actions that their new system their encompass system has led to some delays so they have a backlog but they're almost back up to their pre-encompass uh, levels so um, the Southern Trust also have an, uh, an IS contract and they're taking some of the South Eastern Trust as well as their own. Um, but in a couple of months, as long as nobody else um, is unavailable across the uh, region, we should have a more stable breast uh, workforce. And as Tomas says, uh, you know, we are looking at national evidence and looking at practice elsewhere for what does uh, you know? What do break breast services look for for the under 25s? What do breast pain pathways look like elsewhere? Is it necessarily a triple assessment? So and that's what Tomas is alluding to. Actually, looking at other evidence to say what uh, what is required and what is best to protect. You know, 14 day services requires triple assessment. So how do we ensure that the you know that the appropriate people get to that pathway, but other people aren't waiting? excessively long because they're not getting access um, so we hope to have stabilized that workforce um, and the work certainly the modernization work should um, start <coughs> to be embedded in the next number of months for breast can I come in quickly just to say that I would like or I'm sure the committee would like to be kept updated just in that work around what 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 any kind of transformation of <coughs> services will look like mm -hmm. because we've had a previous history with this and and it became very exercised very quickly and now, now we'll never know whether it was the right thing or the wrong thing because the, it wasn't planned it wasn't it wasn't neither the staff nor the the people in the community were brought along with with a plan to to transform and change breast services and we'll never know now whether it was the right thing or the wrong thing it may well have been the right thing but we need to make sure that we're aware of it as public representatives we said it before we will not jump up and down if services and particularly if outcomes are going to be better for the people that we serve but they need to be informed they need to be brought on the journey and so do staff so i suppose it's just ensuring that we don't end up in that same position again so well, we can, appreciate we can, that no. we can give that assurance that uh, absolutely i mean we are not intending on hiding anything from you that's i can give that assurance absolutely thank you thank you, thank you. yeah thank you very much um so see just in terms of some of the work that you have been doing with um the trusts around trying to improve um, efficiencies and prog productivity. Um, I had mentioned in the, the brief and note that you have been working with each of the area, trust areas um, to look at the, the best practice service improvement. And I'm just wondering how much sort of um, output are you getting from that? You know, who's overseeing that work with the trusts? and you know, how beneficial is it in terms of reducing um, the elective care waiting lists? That's my first question. So on, on a very generic level, 
in which release I can speak much more with details, but on generic level, even the small changes, if you make many small changes, make a big difference. So, I mean, our, our hips is a very, very long waiting list. If we sometimes did three hips in a day and changed to four hips, it doesn't sound much, but that, that's a third increase in capacity. And over a space of a year, that ends up to quite significant difference in number of hips. If we can move it to five or six, we're suddenly creating quite a big difference. And those changes can often be done by making very small changes. So maybe increasing, I mean, so for hips, if you increase the, number, the, the time the physios work to in the evening, that means people can go home quicker because they're mobilized. It's a very small change. We can make a big difference for overall productivity. If you make those, place, those things everywhere, mm -hmm. all those m minor things suddenly becomes quite, quite major. So that's, that, that's something we're trying to encourage a culture shift on a big strategic level that everything we do is about how can we do it better? Mm -hmm. How can we change just a little bit to make a big difference? On top of a slightly bigger change as well. Um, so in, in every meeting we have, in every setting we have this trust, this is what we talk about. So it's, it's, not, it's not just one dedicated program, even there's also that. It's, it's about changing the culture to always find improvements, always encourage local innovation. Yeah, and if I can just pick up on the best best evidence, so we have used GERF, the Get It Right First Time dream, mm -hmm. uh, Team from NHS England, uh, on a number of areas. So um, with orthopaedics when they came, actually they helped um, a number of trusts look at their skills mix, their uh, you know their skills mix in theatres, which actually with the workforce that they had enabled more theatre lists to be available. Um, when we've looked at the urology, they recommended that we move for a cohort of stone. Uh, patients actually handheld devices called TULAs that actually a consultant doesn't need to do it, but your urology CNS could use it. Um, so actually we have just funded and have rolled out TULA uh, and it's uh, operational in one trust and the second trust is coming online. So we have used that best evidence for actually, you know, with you, know, you can get, this is more efficient if you do this. So we've started doing that using GERFT. Uh, but more fundamentally, we use our peer, um, you know, peer benchmarking information, and we use the uh, British Association of Day Case Surgery guidance. So we are moving as much out of an inpatient theatre into a day case mm -hmm. uh, theatre, and likewise moving as many procedures out of a day case theatre into an outpatient mm -hmm. uh, procedure room. Um, so OMA will see scopes moving uh, to procedure room for some of them, um, in line with that guidance. Uh, and what we've been able to do is we've been able to um, benchmark theatre utilisation. Um, so we look at utilisation, but we also look at theatre op time, because if you use the two matrix, you get a better sense of what's actually happening. Um, so, And we've only been doing this work for the 23-24 year. So theatre utilisation is at 90%, um, which is above the target that you would expect. Uh, and it always sat at about 87. So 3% doesn't feel much, but it's more than your, your peer would be saying you should be doing with your theatre utilisation. And a similar increase in op time, we're at 81%. Um, when we started at 77. Mm -hmm. um, so 81 to 82 is probably what you would expect. So we are driving that improvement up mm -hmm. and, and making sure that we're doing it in line with best practice because that means that we're doing it in a safe way yep. and we're not compromising uh, patient safety as we're doing it. Um, and if you, you know, when you bring the evidence, you know, and our workforce actually want to treat patients, they want to treat patients safely. Uh, you, we have an open door on, on nearly everything that we're doing from an operational and from a policy side. And is it yourself, sorry, that oversees yes, so that with, the, with the, the trusts? Yeah. With the um, trusts? So um, I, I'm part of SPPG, it used to be the Health and Social Care Board, so yeah. we're the operational side of the department. Tomas is my policy counterpart, so my uh, elective team uh, are driving the efficiency productivity. Um, I also have the waiting list management unit who are also dri you know, driving the text reminder, the validation mark. Uh, the uh, compliance with IAAP, which is the rules for, for waiting times, so we'll pick that up. Uh, so yes, that sits with the SPBD, so we do that um, to hold all trusts to the same standards uh, and uh, work together on that. Yeah, no, very good. It's good to hear some of that feedback, um, Lisa and Tomas, because in all of the conversations we've been having around the really serious issues that the health service is under at present, it keeps coming up time and time again that everyone needs to get smarter in terms of efficiency and productivity because there is no sort of, you know, um, there is no endless pot of money to, to, to throw at the issues that we're facing. So it's good to know that some of those wee initiatives are actually paying off in, in certain circumstances. And then um, my last question is around, um, yeah, see the 135 million 
that in, it, you're saying if it, that that's the that would be the requirement um, to try and deal with the waiting lists as they are, although it's not going to it's not going to deal with them all. Um, so that was the bid that you have put forward to the minister to bid for his overall budget for waiting lists. Yes, I mean, 135 yeah. million is what we think the maximum we can spend in a year. Yeah. We, we, I mean, we, we can always spend less if we get less outcomes. Yes. We don't think we can physically spend more because there is no capacity to spend it on. Yes. So we see you on that 135 million then. Um, so uh, I'm sorry if, if you, you addressed this um, earlier. So can you give a breakdown of within that 135 million, what proportion of that could possibly go towards the independent sector? could possibly go towards um, cross-border initiatives with Britain or with the South or with the EU? Do you have any sort of breakdown as to what that...? You know, we, we, can, we can give breakdowns to a degree. I'm not sure if that would be necessarily that accurate, mm -hmm. um, because it depends on how we get the money. If we get £135 million pounds tomorrow mm -hmm. for next financial year, but only for one year, we can probably say roughly what that would look like. If we get £135 million, or, or even less, over a number of years, we can then say we, we get better, more effective contracts with others. We can just we can do more sustainable investments, meaning we would spend differently. Um, so it, it's hard to give an accurate picture on the breakdown. We, 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 can, we can certainly provide something, and it might be helpful to do the right thing too. But it, just with those caveats, it is hard to be accurate mm -hmm. when there's so many variables on how many how many would be available and when it would be available and what. We can do with it. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm just trying to get a sense of you know if you, you get the budget that is required and that you need, how much of that resource practically are we investing into our own national health service? Do you know what I mean? To try and get things done ourselves. Do you know just in terms of capacity and stuff. In, in general, if, it, if it's in a shorter period of time, it'd be more to the independent sector than to us because. Yeah. Um, yeah because because. Uh, you know, it, it's very unattractive for trust to go out to recruit for someone to do additionality for less than a 12 month contract because they can go to the IS or they can go to another mm -hmm. jurisdiction um, but <coughs> there is always that you know you know, as I said you know, value for money you know, intuitively says doing it in house with our existing staff evenings and weekends it is actually you know what you want mm -hmm. um, but there's only so many hours in the day uh, and there's only so many weekends and then you're competing for the same theatres uh, at the weekend so there is uh, you know on a short term basis you invest you don't expand your workforce whereas even a three year contract even if it's not even a five year contract mm -hmm. you actually can bring people in because you're thinking in two years really you're a proleptic post because someone's going to retire in two years it'd be great to already have you but trust with the state of the financial pressures can't take that risk when there's not a recurrent funding. Whereas if they employ someone for two to three years and we've only given them funding for a year, then that creates a deficit yeah. uh, issue for their accounting officers. So, uh, and that's why Tomas said, uh, you know, sometimes a longer term, um, even if it's a smaller amount, actually gives us more opportunity to build core capacity. Yeah. Uh, and actually do succession planning and ex skills expansion, <coughs> uh, even if it's not a fully recurrent allocation, it does give us options for the HSC. Thank you very much. Diane. Thank you. Um, so first of all, um, thank you for the briefing. I would have to say I was disappointed in the briefing paper. I thought it would give us more detail and I think the conversation we have had has been more helpful because I could have picked up the stats and probably had them from the, the last waiting times that were organised, but I do think the conversation is more helpful than that. Um, so just a couple of things that I, I want to just get clarity on. Every time we talk about waiting lists, people in this context, this political context, bring up the cross-border scheme. Now, I am not against, I think, I'm happy that we go wherever we need to go to get waiting lists brought down. That is not an issue for me. But... It seems to me, and Lisa, I'm picking up your point about the equity of the cross-border scheme. I'm right in saying that you can only access it if you can pay up front yes. um, for that. So that rules out a significant number of people oh. unless families club together in order to do it or, or whatever. So there is, there is an equity mm -hmm. um, issue, real equity issue about the cross-border scheme. Not that it isn't useful and so on, but I'd also really like you to write to the committee and tell us that in the period 
uh, when the Minister um, initiated the cross-border scheme after the EU directive was lost following Brexit, how many cases actually um, were, um, how many people used it and how much did it actually cost and how, you know, and, and I, I don't know whether you have the figures about how much people paid versus how much they were reimbursed. Because there is a discrepancy in that, as, 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 as I understand it. I mean, all I'm making the point is, it is not the catch-all that some folk tend to think it is. It definitely is not. And it does have equity implications for those who can't um, access it. I was really disappointed that your briefing paper did not give us more detail on cancer red flag referrals. And I am very concerned in Northern Ireland that we have a disparity of treatment across different trusts for different um, tumour sites and, and for the, the, the way and the, the waiting times. Uh, is there a problem, for example, in the Northern Trust um, with um, cancer uh, or investigation times for um, bowel cancer referrals? I was informed um, just recently of a person who needed investigation for bowel cancer. That um, referral was made in January and they were told it might be July before they're seen. I, I'm, that really concerns me and I, I, I would like to see some figures that are comparative across trusts um, as to how you treat and how, how patients are treated in terms of different cancers. And, and, and I know that you probably don't have all that information in the here and now, but I think that's the kind of information that we'd like to see. And it's back to Linda's point about, you know, it's about, I know it's about capacity, but I also want to make sure that trusts are doing what they should be doing to make sure that, that um, cancer patients are seen in a timely fashion. And I think that's really, really important. Um, the the other um, questions that, that I wanted to ask, um, are maybe you want to come back on those first, and then I, I just have a couple more things that I, I want to ask that are specific. But I, I, I really think that we would, this committee would benefit from having more information, more detailed information on some of this. Um, so, so I can start with uh, bowel cancer. So yes. l lower GI has a particular problem um, in the diagnostics and that 31 day targets starting treatment within, or um, so the definite treatment within 31 days of decision to treat this particular problem in that, spe in that area. Can you explain uh, that to us? So th they have difficulties in uh, with demand capacity. The demand is outstripping capacity by quite significant margins. This is, sorry, sorry to, to ask you yeah. questions in the middle of it. Yeah. I apologise for that. Is that because you're actually doing more um, investigation, so you're finding more uh, cancers, or you just don't have the capacity? There is a combination of all three. So cancer rates are increasing in Northern Ireland with our ageing population and increasing population size. If we count for ageing of population and population size, cancer rates are about the same. Um, but the overall... Um, the cancer increasing because we, we are we are more and getting older. Um, in cancers as well, how we treat cancers and what's required for cancer diagnostics have changed quite a lot in the last few years and unexpectedly. So changes during COVID turned out to actually work cancer patients. <coughs> the meaning that, um, for example, chemotherapy is used differently than it was five years ago. <coughs> so the increase in chemotherapy has increased by 41% in five years. Um, so, so cancer as a, as a whole, as, as a system, is under huge pressures. They were somewhat unexpected five years ago. Um, and, and that is something we're, we're trying to address through waiting this initiative funding and non-recurrent funding, but it's fundamental. There's a core demand capacity gap in the service. The, the specifics about Northern Trust and bowel cancer, I have to come back to in writing. But um, we, we can, that's a general problem in that, in that part of the body. There is a particular problem. It's a lower gastrointestinal. Areas, that's a particular problem. I think we would all in this room be concerned to hear that answer. And I think it would be really useful if we had some information across all of the trusts, not just the Northern Trust in relation um, to that. Um, th that does concern me greatly. Um, 
and so on. So that's sorry, you, you go ahead. Uh, and, Sorry, was, yeah. uh, and you know, we can certainly provide uh, specialty uh, weights by trust because we have, uh, in, in supporting Tomas's policy work in cancer, we have a cancer dashboard that breaks that all yes. down. Um, and whilst I don't have the lower GI, uh, what I do have is the uh, northern, you know, when we look at uh, the 62 day pathway and Tomas has alluded to it, that's where we capture the diagnostic component because the 31 day is you've been you've had your diagnosis, you've agreed to a decision to treat, and 31 days is then that, that time to actually have that treatment, be it chemotherapy, radiotherapy, hormones, or surgery. But the 62-day pathway uh, is probably where we spend most of our efforts because the performance is, you know, the percentage ha continues to drop year on year, and it's causing the biggest concern. Um, so we're currently sitting at about 34% uh, adherence to the 62-day pathway, and the Northern Trust is not... A significant outlier. It's in the middle of the pack of the five trusts, uh, but as I say, that's that's all. So on an average, levels. we're sitting on a for um, um, something like lower intestinal cancers. We're sitting on a pathway of treatment that is only at thirty four percent of where we should be, and the target is two days. Only thirty four percent of those patients. And then that is that is completely unacceptable. We're not we're not trying to we're not trying to justify the figures. Um, I th that actually sh both shocks, terrifies, and worries me. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I mean, you know, I just want to make it very clear that both Elise and I we we are not taking pride in those figures. Um, so is, so, so is there some way that you will come back to us with a pa with a plan to actually rectify that? Is 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 there? I mean, I can't I can't. There, there, I can't leave that without knowing that there will be a plan to rectify that. So there, there's two aspects. One is that we're spending quite a lot of non-recurrent waiting list funding on the red flag pathways. That is to shore up to even get to 34%. Um, and that is not funding we have next quarter at this point. So I mean, I just want to make that clear that this is a non-recurrent additionality in the, in the past. Um, the cancer strategy, which sets it, sets a strategic direction for cancers, it is looking at quite significant transformation on both oncology and hematology and the wider cancer services. We know that our cancer services cost more and deliver less and have worse outcomes than almost all other jurisdictions around us. We, we, we need to improve. So that, in, that includes enabling our doctors and nurses and other professionals who are very good and dedicated, give them the tools to do their job as effective as they can. Um, and and that, is, that is requires whole skill transformation. Cancer services have lagged behind other areas um, in transformation, and that is something we, we are, address, are addressing quite urgently through the cancer strategy. It's not quick fixes, though. Th these are these are quite major service changes and changes how we deliver, how we think about delivering services. So it's it's not it's not easy work, uh, and it's not quick work. So that's it's not the answer you want to hear, but I don't want to lie to you. No, no, Thomas, I appreciate that, and um, I think if we are to work with you, and I don't think anybody in this room wants to work against you at all, if we are to work with you, we want to understand what the position is, how we got there, and, and what we can do to plan it. Um, sorry, I, I um, spent quite a bit of time in that. Um, I brought a motion to the Assembly, and it was one of the first motions that we debated, um, and um, it was on um, waiting lists and during his response the minister indicated that he would do a review of the elective care pathway. <clears throat> Is that review underway and when will we hear the outcomes of that review? Yes, so, so my, my team is leading the review of elective care framework. We have committed to have a final published version by end of June. Thank you. That's, that's very useful to know as well. That's very useful. Um, I do have lots of other questions, but other colleagues. Thank you, maybe. Diane. Nola? Um, um, thank you. So just um, following on, uh, well, well, first of all, th thank you very much for coming today um, to present. Um, I think all of us recognise that the waiting times are unacceptable currently and we need, do need a strategy to fix it both in the short term but also whilst we are fixing um, waiting lists in the short term we need to change the system so that it doesn't actually get that, that bad again and that's so important that's why transformation should work alongside that so I have a number of questions relating to that but first of all just a supplementary from Diane's on that elective car framework and um, in terms of that review 
have you actually been engaging with likes of um, the Royal College of Surgeons, for example, um, with how the rollout of the current surgical hubs is working and whether its effectiveness is um, as effective as it should be um, and whether that kind of review includes engagement with stakeholders and clinicians, experts who are actually doing this work um, on the ground. Yeah, and, and the simple answer is yes. Um, this, this work doesn't sit in isolation. It sits in part of the wider, wider work we're doing in electric care and have been doing for a number of years. <coughs> so we, for example, have set up the electric care management team, which is a, uh, which, which we both co-chair. Um, Dimitri Agler did sits with trusts, but we also engage them with clinicians, which are also represented on the electric care um, management team, and with Royal Colleges and many others for that sake. So um, people on the ground, that, that's, that's how this is coming. Um, this is not... It's not, it's not something my team is sitting doing just by itself. It's, it's part of this bigger thing. So, for example, effectiveness of elective care centres. We know that GERFT, so they're getting it right first time, they do accreditation for day procedure centres. So we will start that this year to um, put Lagan Valley through accreditation process because that's one way to ensure that we are following best practice, that we that it is value for money, and that it's doing what it should be doing. I mean, we don't have concerns about that, but having that accreditation gives us that assurance that that is the case, and it gives everyone evidence that it's working. Okay. Um, well, thank you for that. That, that's, that is good to know that um, it's kind of work goes hand in hand with the people who are, are carrying it out. Um, and if I just stay with that issue then at the moment in terms of the surgical hubs um, and the day procedure units um, and the overnight procedures, um, in terms of the infrastructure that was built, um, particularly at the, the SWA, are, is the entire infrastructure utilised? I mean, is I understand, is it two units, like two day procedure units, um, and are they both commissioned to carry out work? Um, it's just my understanding is that, that, that not everything that has been created is actually being utilised and used to, to actually carry out so active care work. The <coughs> South West Acute Hospital has five theatres, mm-hmm. and two are not commissioned for use. So three are commissioned used, and they're, they're used regularly, and they're used um, almost to full capacity. Uh, for normal work, but two are not commissioned for use. So then they're not being used regularly by the health service, and, and we don't have staff for it, and we don't have operations, patients going through those two, those two theatres. And, and the reason why you're not using it is because of workforce issues? I mean, there has been no recurrent investment to invest in the workforce, and everything that's everything, everything required to have a theatre up and running. Mm-hmm. So everything from surgeons to nurses to the, the ward space required and the, the whole package. Mm-hmm. So everything comes back, well not everything, but a lot of things come back to the, the workforce, so that's why kind of the short term and the long term planning are, are go together. Um, but with regards to um, the surgical hubs, not versus, but working alongside the unplanned care, so or unscheduled as, as you named it, is there um, an argument for the Royal, for example, being ring-fenced for carrying out just that specialised work? Um, and then the unscheduled trauma care or whatever might arise there Um, and has it ever been kind of thought that this might actually work better and more effective if we have for example a surgeon stationed for or a number of surgeons stationed for a week to carry out the same types of procedures so that more people can get through the system so that these specialties can take place at the Royal and will we eventually move to that system where ring-fenced care takes place where it needs to be so that any elective care that people can go to the, the hospitals that actually carry them out. And, yeah. yes. and, and the simple answer is yes, again, I mean, we, this, this is part of the work, so we want to ring-fence, we want to essentially put a wall, although maybe not a physical wall, between elective and was planned and unplanned, so because they, they don't go well together, they're very different things. That can be in separate buildings, they can be in the same building, but there needs to be a clear break between, between the two. Um, it's easier to create unscheduled centres in sites that don't have emergency surgery. So, for example, City Hospital does not have an ED. So, therefore, having that for, um, un, for planned complex elective surgery works very well. Mm-hmm. Similar that Lagan Valley is very good for day procedure centres. Something like the Royal is difficult because it provides really complex treatments. Um, as well as unscheduled treatment, so it's, it's probably hard to ring fence royal for for one top another. But the service that's being provided in theatres should be ring fenced from other services, um, w- with a artificial wall. If you put it that way. I mean, you, but you you mentioned though that, for example, cardiac cataracts, sorry, 
cataracts is taking place at the Royal as well. And you, you mentioned a number of other hospitals, but surely, does it? Why is it just the specialties such as thoracic, cardiac, neurology? I can't remember the and vascular yeah. at the Royal, and then all other scheduled care at the <coughs> other hubs that we've created, in order for the protected space, theatre space, theatre nurses, etc. The instruments are there. You know what instruments are used for each procedure. Um, you know. I, I understand that waiting lists, um, tackling waiting lists, but they also need to be prioritised in terms of the impact on life and, and a person's life. And being on a waiting list actually costs more than, than being treated. So how far are we from moving to that situation where those procedures that are taking place in certain units that can actually take place elsewhere like happen? When, when will we get to that position? And just coming back to cataracts, um, because there's a very small number of uh, cataract cases done at the Royal and they are the most complex and they're likely to have other comorbidities um, because actually the, you know, the ideal for cataract is absolutely not in the, you know, even in the main DGH hospital. That's why we have the Mid Ulster, we have Oma and South Throne, so there's a very small, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I was misleading when I, I was just indicating all the sites that do um, cataract. Uh, and, and the Royal is, um, the Royal is our major trauma centre um, um, and, and that in itself means that there will have to be lots of specialties that actually who are available for trauma. Um, so we have moved lots of specialties out to BCH but neurosurgery is in the Royal and there will still be elective neurosurgery um, and the teams and the facilities and the requirements on the ICUs probably always going to mean that's probably going to stay there. Uh, but but they are conversations and explorations as to where is the right fit for services. And then connected with that is, because um, the other impact that sometimes elective had, if it's not a bed pressure, uh, as in there's no inpatient bed, sometimes it was there's no ICU bed and this patient might need an ICU bed. Uh, and we've got, you know, we've got the emergency pressures for the ICU. So one of the investments that was uh, outlined in the electric care framework is our post anaesthetic care units so it's our PACU beds and um, so there's been investments so they are you still require um, a higher level of support coming out of your inpatient but you're not a you're not a HDU you're not an ICU patient and um, so and that was a learning from COVID and um, so we have invested and we will have investments for 22 PACU beds because that's another way of separating the elective and unscheduled pressures and even the ICU competing pressures. Um, but the unscheduled pressures uh, compete for our diagnostics, for scopes, for CT, for MRI, um, you know, as well as beds. I know, and I understand that, and it is important that unscheduled and emergency care, you know, has to, has yeah. to happen. But... Um, you know, specialise in, in those areas that I had, that I mentioned, you know, can also be ring-fenced at, at particular hospitals too. And my understanding um, from engaging with the workforce is that the workforce, and particularly the consultants, are already there in terms of the willingness to have, you know, the, the, the units where it's right, these procedures are going to be carried out, to say, because you will have the the workforce already there, the specialised nurses, the, the instruments, the so the cost effectiveness um, that you could do like six in a day instead of five, like what we previously um, explained. Um, that brings me on to the next question that I have with regarding um, waiting lists. It's often before diagnosis and then moving over to, to treatment is the, the time it might be one year, two year, three years, um, but um, on the person it's actually quite a massive impact and communication is a very big issue um, and we did attend an event yesterday and the health minister briefly attended um, with versus arthritis in terms of um, they worked alongside a lot of practitioners um, regarding communication or the, the lack thereof and there was one um, patient who, who actually used the words that the silence is deafening and you're left without without any indication of where you are and your condition is worsening and there are other models elsewhere um, that we could look at um, for example in Wales but in terms of just a starting point for communication is there anything mm. that couldn't be done now in, in the short term whilst anything else is looking at, looked at with having better communication with patients so that they're not completely in the dark? 
And if I start, Tomas, if you don't mind. Um, yes, um, and we have made some inroads in that. So um, we have a My Waiting Times website that's available for the region, which built on NHS England's work. Um, and that was deliberately designed to actually very publicly um, and make it available. F- and, to be, and there are leaflets in GP practices uh, and in our hospital sites to signpost patients to the My Waiting Times website. And it provides information at trust level, but at specialty level, and it gives the mean weight for red flag, urgent and routine. So it kind of gives an indication of uh, now there'll be patients who wait shorter and patients who wait longer. Uh, And we have replicated the NHS England um, model um, in its entirety in terms of how you calculate it. Uh, what uh, what information is available. Um, so that is available for assessment, for treatment and diagnostics. Uh, so if you live in a trust, you can look in uh, and see. Um, we've had a lot of uh, uh, discussion about can it be more tailored to the individual? And there's, you know, with chronological management and with... Um, There'll always be patients with a higher priority, so it's really difficult to say you are on a waiting list and you're, in fact, we're not going to be able to say you're on a waiting list and you're 450th in the queue because actually tomorrow um, you could actually validate out 50 of those patients and you come down. Or likewise, if you're a routine patient, you could have 100 urgent referrals that come in uh, or red flag and then you move. So um, we will be able to, ut- utilising Encompass, get more information out um, and there is when we talk to colleagues in Wales uh, and, and and England in particular um, you know there's the validation communication that you can only put out so many times because actually you I've already told you I'm still I still have this and I'm still waiting I don't want you to write to me again in six months just ask that question and actually you're writing me and you're not telling me when I'm going to get treated so there is a balance of how do you communicate well and what is helpful to communicate uh, and we think there is an opportunity with Encompass when all five trusts uh, are out to actually look and see what can be generated uh, automatically out on a six monthly or a monthly basis to say, uh, and it's that you're not forgotten. You are, you know, we are confirming you are definitely still on this. And, but also, um, we have been talking through with our, uh, and I think you had a briefing on the ICS uh, earlier in this week. There is. The role that we and our AAPBs, uh, you know, and it replicates the Welsh model using our community voluntary uh, partners, our council partners who have their community health agenda to actually say, what can we provide by way of signposting to stop you deconditioning, to help you um, help you wait well uh, or living well? And we have some examples of orthopaedic programmes, particularly in the Western Trust in that space, but also drive that, um, you know, try and stop or try and reduce smoking or you know um you could you know if you lost a little bit of weight whilst you're waiting you know all those kind of programs where you're you know that prehab that stopping deconditioning but also um helping people uh, you know support you know pain management signposting those um so we have some pilots of that uh, and we do think that there's much more that we can do in that space and we would do that with our public health agency colleagues and with the AIPBs because I think there is more that can be done. Thank you for that. I think that was what was important and certainly coming out of event yesterday, particularly hearing from patients when, when she was diagnosed and it was a breast cancer um, issue, the volume of information and assistance versus other um, waiting lists. Um, so I think it's really important to help people wait well because we all know we're not mm-hmm. going to tackle waiting lists within a week, but we need to help people who are waiting with the right information and assistance through, through other means. Thank you. Okay, Danny. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, obviously, a lot of really big figures um, there and shocking, shocking issue. Um, we've previously heard here that there is, we've previously heard it said, um, that there is a two-tier system in Northern Ireland, um, which effectively exists at the minute where people are paying large amounts of money to go private, um, to pay for their parents sometimes, borrowing money to do um so <coughs> the only way that we're going to reverse that is by tackling the waiting list head on. Now, from what you've said, this is going to take years. It is a long-term project and it will require a lot of um, multi-year investment. So certainly, you know, we are here in that. I want to drill down just into a little bit of um, what you're saying in the report. The six quarters in a row, the reduction of six quarters in a row is very reassuring to hear. Um, particularly the 28 
20.8 decrease in patient waiting for inpatient day case admission for general surgery. Um, I'm just wondering, is there a breakdown of what that decrease is? <coughs> are all these people getting the procedures? <coughs> are, are there other reasons for people coming off the lists? Um, are they getting it done privately? Are they some of these people who are going on to the two-tier system and then being removed from the lists? Are they becoming too unwell to get the, to get the procedure? Are they progressing on to another list? Um, so just to have a bit of a breakdown about that figure, it's good to see that this is being decreased, but why? You know, that's, that's um, just a couple of other questions and then. Yeah. Um, the other one was just to pick up from Noah's point. Yeah, I was at that uh, event yesterday about the Welsh model, and certainly there appears to be a lot of benefits from uh, the 3P programme in the Welsh Health Service, benefits to the patients and the health service, and it would be very interesting in seeing how the department would progress that to see if we can treat people better while they're waiting. Um, people do feel isolated and lost and forgotten about. Um, so I think that when we have particularly long periods of years, there was one um, example given yesterday of a dermatology uh, wait where there was one text message in five years. You know, that's, we're forgetting about patients. You know, we are just forgetting about them. Um, and I, I appreciate that, that there are ongoing trials uh, and Encompass might provide a bit more um, opportunity then for um, to be able to do something on that. Lisa, just one last question. You had mentioned DNAs and cancelled procedures. I'm just wondering what the rates are like uh, and comparatively across the UK and Ireland. Is there anything particular about that? And is there an understanding of the reasons for the DNAs uh, and what's being done just to tackle that? Thank you. With that last one, if that's okay. Uh, so the DNA and CNA rate. Um, so we have them for assessment. So um, we have seen a slight improvement, but it is in the context of. So we do between 1.6 and 1.8 uh, patient um, consultations with a consultant every year. Um, so through our text reminder work and some of the mega clinic and the pre-op assessment that I described earlier, uh, we have seen new outpatient uh, DNA CNA drop. Um, from 7.3 to 7.5, so it's you know it, it's a small percentage point, but in the context of a large volume of activity, uh, and our reviews have fallen from um, 9.1 to 8.4, so 7.5 to 7.3 and 9.1 to 8.4, um, and there so we do actually capture the reason for de for uh, do, uh, for non attendance, but we also capture the reason for. Uh, cancellation both by patient and by hospital team uh, and we've had a lot of focus on the hospital team cancellations so the waiting list management unit uh, that sits within my directorate um, we have changed the coding um, to minimize the number because we started a process where there was 27 reasons why the hospital would cancel a, a booked uh, clinic and actually we have stream streamlined that down so that we've standardized it but there are controllable factors and there are uncontrollable. So if the if a key member of the clinical team um, is sick that day, that's you know uh, that's an uncontrollable. But if they have taken leave but they didn't apply and it wasn't approved six weeks ago, that's a controllable factor that actually means that that's a wasted clinic slot. Uh, now sometimes clinics are backfilled by others. So we have had a lot of focus on hospital cancellations and particularly the ones that are, are within control if they follow. The guidance which is in the IEAP, the elective access protocol. Um, so we have a lot of focus on that and then uh, but we still have a high level of DNAs from patients and I referenced earlier even those that have confirmed the day before mm -hmm. that are not coming um, and we through the My Waiting Times we are going to take a bit of learning from Wales to actually, uh, actually indicate the opportunity lost from the do not attends. Um, because actually they're not a free good and it's stopping potentially stopping somebody else getting that slot. So um, now there will always be the exceptions as to absolutely legitimate reasons for not attending. Um, but we are having a strong focus because um, you know, really difficult to lose those slots uh, when we have the weights that we have. Um, so we have a strong focus, but I'm happy to give more detail on that uh, and more of the breakdown of the reasons. Okay, happy to do that. Um, when it comes to the question, so... Uh, Breakdown on how patients come off the general surgery with treatment list. I don't know if we can have the exact breakdown, but what we what we can say we, we can give as much breakdown as we can, mm -hmm. um, and we can see there's been an increase in activity. So it's not just that people have been taken off the waiting list 
for other reasons, but our core activity in the health service has increased uh, with the reduction of the waiting list, which is what we would want to see. Um, if there was a reduction in our own activity and a reduction in waiting list, that means we come off for other reasons. But it came off because we treated more patients, which is which is a good thing. Um, we can see that going hand in hand. With, sorry. Just explain that again. Sorry, sorry. Pardon if I'm not clear. So we our core our activity for those general surgery patients, the number of patients we've seen have increased, and that activity increase has correlated with a decrease in people waiting, okay. which indicated they come off. I mean, the, the reduction waiting list is because we treated more people. Okay. If that wasn't the case, they would have come off for other reasons. Mm-hmm. But that's we see that the two go hand in hand. Um, and it also goes hand in hand with the review of general surgery and implementation of the review. Mm-hmm. So the implementation of elective overnight stay centers and day procedure centers. So that work goes hand in hand with the reduction in the waiting list. Mm-hmm. And that's where we see those patients. So general surgery patients would often be seen at day procedure centers and elective overnight stay centers. So a significant portion of black and violet patients are general surgery patients. Mm-hmm. So it, it correlates with the new work we're doing and with the up with the uptake of things <laughs> it is because we're treating more patients. But uh, we'll get as much breakdown as we can. Um, it's particularly, it'd be particularly interesting to see in how many people come off the, uh, the waiting list because they've went private, because they have went to the other tier, and or they've yeah. become unwell and not been able to... We'll, we'll, we'll get you as good much information as we can. Yeah, we, we have some information from our validation work, which captures... Um, uh, you know, I, I no longer have that complaint or I have been treated elsewhere. Um, so we can certainly have a look at that because the validation, both administrative and clinical, um, in the last year has seen so has seen about 37,000 patients coming off waiting lists. Mm-hmm. Um, so they won't have been had active treatment because they've either said they don't require it, they don't want it, or they've been treated elsewhere. But only... But the majority of those are outpatient, um, so 33,000 of those are outpatients who have been validated, outpatient waiters who are not uh, no longer waiting, so 4,500 were treatment waiters. So could you just repeat those figures again? Uh, 4,500 for in, uh, for waiting for treatment have been validated uh, and removed from the waiting list, and 33,000 waiting for assessment. Waiting for assessment? They were waiting for an assessment, but they may have been waiting... For, uh, I think there was an example. Yes. So, yeah, uh, and when they are contacted as part of probably the very long waiters, it will be an initial admin validation. Uh, we're contacting you on a wait. You know, can we just check? You know that you're you you still have the this complaint. You still wish to be. And people will say, no, I've been treated elsewhere, or no, I don't have that issue anymore. This um, this is a reflection of how long the waiting lists are, and they've moved on. Either been treated somewhere else. So these very likely are the people who are going to the independent sector. Uh, for for assessment, they it, it's more likely that they don't have the complaint anymore. Uh, for the treatment, they may have been treated elsewhere, or mm. they may have been seen by uh, another trust, or they may have been to an ED. And actually, whatever they were on the waiting list for is actually not their primary health concern at this point in time. So they may have been on the list for orthopedics, but they currently have they're having a cardiac episode, or mm. uh, you know. So there is, um, but the. If the inpatient list is more likely to be a clinical validation rather than an admin validation. Um, so it's not just a, a letter going out. Can you, you know, there'll be a two-step <coughs> process um, in the main, um, just so that there's a certainty in that. That would be very interesting to see a, a okay. breakdown on that. But, um, thank you. And, and, and re- regarding the 3P work, so the, the waiting well policy in, in Wales, I mean, the, the, the waiting well, we, we, all, we all know people waiting list. I mean, we're probably... Quite a few of us in this room probably are on waiting lists, in, mm. including myself. Mm. Um, so this is not something we fully agree with. It does come down to a matter of resource. Mm. Um, th- these programs are not expensive, but they cost money. And, and we can't do more of these programs without investments. It's, it's that simple. They quoted yesterday a uh, pilot scheme of 120,000 for a population of 400,000, which seems a relatively small amount of money for quite a large cohort yeah. and to see benefits to the service as well as the patient yes so, so one, of, one of my staff were at the event yesterday as well and she, she, she was going to speak to them to get the exact details of what this actually was yep. um, <laughs> because I, I would agree on the face of it it sounds like a very good investment mm-hmm. but I, we don't have any more detail than what was said yesterday either so, so uh, but they've already been in contact this morning I believe so thank you yeah, Alan Chambers uh, thanks Chair thank you very much for the presentation just uh, my couple of questions you have I partially answered them. The uh, 
the, the previous speakers. But the, if the minister is successful in getting the, the his bid, the 135 million, and, and we, we start the journey of the of tackling the waiting lists, um, at the moment, do, do we need to create any more theatre space, or do we have sufficient? And, and is the current issue the fact just a lack of specialised staff to maximise the stock that we already have? So if, if, if it is the case that it's, it's staff issues going forward, um, what would be the plan within the initiative to tackle that or to bring the to, to fully utilise the, the theatre space? Would it be a case of um, bringing in uh, locum teams, maybe at weekends, maybe even overseas locum teams? Would that be part of the issue? Because obviously in the short term, if it is a workforce issue, you're not going to be able to recruit and train people, say, in the first year, the first couple of years, to, to take that up. So just how, how, do, you, how do you intend to maximise the, the current capacity within the theatres? And the other issue, and you have alluded to it, is the, I'm just wondering, how, how big of a problem is it for you, patients, you know, cancelling, uh, that have been scheduled for, for elective surgery, uh, and cancelling at short notice? Is that, how big of a, an issue is that? And is that, I mean, we talked earlier about hips, if you can do four a day instead of three, great. But if suddenly you're only doing two because people are crying off, it, it, it's, it defeats the whole purpose of, of what you're trying to achieve. So how, how do you, how do you, how successful are you in filling those gaps when people cancel? Is it a case of just ringing around patients that are on the list and hoping that somebody will respond at 24 hours notice and, and come in and, and get the procedure done? Or, or, or do you just, does the gap just, it's just a gap and you move on? So I will answer the first question, and Lisa, but we can go to the second one. So the, the biggest problem I have waiting list is the backlog. So our, because of tr thanks to transformation work, modernization work ongoing, the core capacity demand gap in waiting lists outside cancer and time critical, it's not that big. We're not far off in being meeting current demand. There are some special particular problems, but overall we're not far off. So the funding required is fundamentally for the backlog patients. So that, that is not long-term capacity we want to create. We want to have shorter-term investment to remove the people that are waiting. Because if, if we could magically remove the waiting list today, mm. we wouldn't have a massive waiting list in a year's time because we can fundamentally cope with current demand. So it, it, and that, that's a difficult. So long-term investment on new staff would not be the, necessarily the right answer either. Mm. With some exceptions, of course, there are some areas where we need that. And we need to shift what, who does what. But fundamentally, it, it's a backlog. Um, so it's about using additional availability. So um, if you're talking theatres, the theatre space itself is not a problem, but it's an additionality to use theatres in the evening at weekends. So the funding could pay for staff that we already have to come in to, to do waiting list work okay. on the weekend. Um, or can use the independent sector to either send money to the independent sector or independent sector coming into our facilities and using those facilities um, to, to treat our patients. So it's not a fundamental space issue. It's a staff. It's, it's an available staff issue. International locums. I mean, I, I think we're quite clear that we're up for anyone who anything that can help. Uh, international recruitment campaigns have gone quite well uh, of late, both for nurses and for doctors. Um, that is tend to be longer term investments, though that tends to be for recurrent post and uh, sustainable uh, filling post. But any way we can do to help with additionality, we'll, we'll take. Um, <coughs> it's a simple answer. Yeah. So when we talk about, you know, we sometimes say money's not going to solve all our problems, but in actual fact, what you're saying, it'll go a long way. If we can pay staff, existing staff, to come in at weekends and, and work late at night and all the rest of it, it will have an impact on the, the backlog. On the backlog, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, okay. And just picking up the, the scale of the challenge for late cancellations, uh, the um, late cancellation, a late cancellation the day before is not as challenging as a late cancellation on the day, uh, particularly if it's for a morning, but if it's for, for outpatients, if it's a, a late cancellation, but it's for an out afternoon clinic, then there will be endeavours to actually ring to say, uh, and actually, um, you know, GPs will also have indicated this patient is available for, um, you know, for short notice, um, you know, and people ringing into waiting list will say I'm happy at short notice to be contacted and here's the number to contact me. So for uh, assessment, 
um, it, it is challenging and it is, you know, it is a loss, you know, to the system. Um, it is much more challenging if you are an inpatient or a day case patient who has been worked up. So you've attended your pre-op assessment or even if you're having a diagnostic scope and you have received your, um, you know, your prep, um, if you were having a, a lower GI scope, um, you can't actually fill that slot if that contact is made on that morning because there isn't time for uh, another individual uh, to take prep if they're having a scope. But I suppose the reason we're doing the pre-op uh, assessment mega clinics is, you know, there's an opportunity maybe for you know moving around the list, to maybe get someone in at the end of the day if we have a cohort who've already been worked up who are suitable for a list in the matter and we've had a cancellation quick get the next person, ring the next 10, make sure that that slot's not lost. Um, because that, that's where we, we, can't, we can ill afford any, uh, any lost sessions. Um, is it a big issue or is it just a, a, an irritation to you? Well, no, it's um, well, when you combine DNA and CNA, it's, you know, for treatments, it, it would be significant. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and finally, does Alan Robinson. Liz, or Chair, sorry, I think most of my question from Danny and Alan has already been focused upon today. Um, it was specifically around those who do not attend. I mean, I think today there's been a lot of very useful but very stark figures that have been presented. Um, and I applaud Diane here for shining a light on figures that weren't presented. And I think one of the, one of the figures that I would like to see presented is a bit of a breakdown on those who do not attend. I mean, we all go to a GP surgery now, and you will see on the wall where they have a monthly tally of those who did not attend and the cost it is to the service. Um, and I'm wondering what education there is around that. Um, what, what actively is the Department of Health doing to try and get into the mindset of people who... There are many reasons why people do not attend, but there are reasons where people just do not bother to attend. Something like that. And we have in, you know, and I suppose we are adjusting the My Waiting Times website to include some of that information, but we have uh, had a number of um, you know, media um, outputs in that space to actually, because we do know the cost of a missed out patient diagnostic and treatment, so we have been putting that messaging out. And with the text reminders, there is an option to actually also put that um, financial cost. Uh, but it's also, and it, and it is, you know, this is a slot that someone else could have used but couldn't use. That's almost, that has, you know, evidence would show that's actually more impactful than it's cost the health system £148. Actually, it's somebody else that didn't get using that. So, you know, we are working with, we have a comms uh, team who works on the electric care management team that Tomas has referenced, actually looking at that. And actually, um, it's not that we're, it's not that we're looking to blame or be antagonistic, but it's actually just saying it's not a free good. Um, and this is what, you know, this is the cost, but actually this is the cost to individuals. And this is the number of patients who could have been treated if you look at the DNA rate um, for, the, for a period of time. Um, so we, we are actively trying to do that uh, and working with colleagues uh, to get that out, um, you know, as widely as possible. Thank you. Thank you both. I mean, I think that, that has been very helpful. Um, and it's certainly put a lot of meat in the bones from what we maybe have been looking at for the last number of weeks. I'm very conscious we have another group waiting to come in, but just my last wee point I was going to ask, when I'd asked about the breakdown of the 135 million, you'd give some figures, Lisa, about what that could do. Is it possible to get those figures just to give us a sense of, of what's possible um, if that funding is achieved? That would be great. Thank you. Thank you both for, for you. coming today. Okay, members. Um, a wee bit behind time, but obviously we we had a lot to co to get through there. We do have. I would have to keep it very tight now because we have about an hour max, and I'm very conscious there's a large group um, waiting to to come in. So um, our next item then is the. Oh, sorry, I should have reminded members we have a session with the Royal College of Surgeons on the 18th of April, um, and that we can consider some of this what we've heard today and on, on coming to that meeting at our strategic planning meeting um, next month as well. So. Um, we now have the, the, uh, another briefing from the Department for Health on the Children's Social Care Services. If I could refer members to page 73, um, where the, we will see the department's briefing paper. Um, and at page 103 is the review of Children's Social Care Services report. Um, at page 391 is the Fostering Network briefing paper. And at page 300. 
and 94, the Reimagined Children's Collective Report on Social Carbon Services, and you also have a hard copy of it uh, <coughs> on your table, on, on your desk as well. So, um, as I said, we've got an hour um, to, to cover this session, and just I'd like to welcome um, Eilish McDaniel, Director of Family and Children's Policy, uh, Moira Redmond, um, Head of Children's Services Review Unit, and Anya Morrison, the Chief so Social Work Officer, and also um, we have a great attendance today from VoIPIC and Include Youth. So you're all very welcome and, and thank you for coming today. So if I could just open up then to officials, you can. Hey, and, thank you. and thank you for your patience as well. We had quite a long session there. Thank you, um, Chair. Good afternoon. Um, you've invited us along um, to discuss children's social care um, services with some emphasis on the independent children's services review undertaken by um, Professor Ray um, Jones. I just wanted to take a, a brief moment to introduce um, children's um, social care services. Um, so they fall within the remit of the five health and social care trusts and include services for children in need, children in, in need of protection, looked after children, adopted children or children in the process of being um, adopted children leaving care and children who have left um, care. Looked after children are accommodated in um, one of 52 children's homes um, in foster care and in a small number of cases cared for at home by their um, parents. The vast majority of looked after children are in foster care, including kinship foster care. Some children spend short periods of time um, in secure care and we have one secure care facility um, in Northern Ireland. Older teenagers may be placed in supported accommodation or in supported lodgings um, to enable them to make the um, transition to independent um, living. The aim is to ensure that children are both safe and supported to stay well and healthy and that their families are enabled and supported um, to keep their children um, safe, well and healthy. Children's social care services have been experiencing significant pressures over the last number of years. And while um, many pressures predate um, the pandemic, um, they were also exacerb exacerbated by it. A number of the pressures are workforce related, including high levels of staff vacancy, high rates of staff turnover and associated waiting lists. However, um, they're also related to pressures within families, including increasing complexity of need, leading to a greater number of referrals to statutory children's services, to more children on the child protection register, and more children being looked after or in care. And this in turn has created pressures on care placements across our children's homes and in foster care. As reported by um, Professor Jones in his review report, over a five-year um, period, that's between 2016-17 and 21-22, the number of children in need grew by 7%, the number on the Child Protection Register by 10%, and the number of children in care by 21%. And over a 10-year period, um, up to 21-22, the number of children in care grew by 37%, and that number has continued to increase. At the end of January this year, the number of children in care was nearly 4,000. At the same time, the number of staff vacancies and staff absent um, remains high and is higher in some trust areas than in others, although this has been um, decreasing overall. At the end of January this year, um, there was a combined vacancy absence rate of around 358 um, social workers. That's across all five trusts uh, and excludes um, management posts. In addition, and as a consequence, trusts have uh, unallocated cases or waiting lists, that is, cases waiting to be allocated um, to a social worker. The total number of unallocated cases across all trusts in January of this year was 1,479, although that was a, a decrease of 34 um, on the December um, figure. Professor Jones did a comparison with the rest of the UK and Ireland and found that children's services in Northern Ireland were dealing with higher rates of referrals, higher rates of children in need and children um, uh, with child protection plans, and the rate of children in care increasing more rapidly in the, in the 10 years between 2012 and 2022. He also compared the number of children's um, social workers across the jurisdictions of the UK, and he found that Northern Ireland had more social workers um, per child population, um, uh, but when, uh, when taking into account the, greatest, uh, the, the number of children in need here in Northern Ireland, that gap um, uh, closes quite significantly. As a result of the pressures within services and the scale of challenges within families, the Health Minister um, commissioned an independent review of children's social care in 2022. Uh, the terms of reference for the review um, were quite broad and we included them in the paper that was um, sent to committee in advance of um, today. The review was intended to be a fundamental examination of children's services with a focus on quality, um, equity, resilience and sustainability. 
the review took place over 16 months. It started in February 22 and ended in, in June 23 with the publication of the review report. Engagement under the review was extensive and Professor Jones spent the first 13 um, months meeting and listening to children and young people, some of whom are in um, the room here um, today, um, with parents, carers, um, leaders, managers and practitioners from the statutory and community and voluntary sectors to understand the issues um, facing services in Northern Ireland and that extended um, to engagement um, in other jurisdictions. In terms of what Professor Jones found, um, some of the headlines um, for committee um, were many examples of good practice, um, uh, care and commitment, long-serving and experienced social workers and managers, um, the need for time and continuity, the value of practical help to families, the skew towards and fear of child protection, examples of well-integrated services but also um, fragmented and siloed services, variation and inequity across the region, services under pressure and um, associated delays, insecure and in some cases inadequate funding and increasing complexity. In relation to workforce, he identified the need to create stability and continuity within the workforce, the need for greater skills mix and, al and alternative routes in, into the workforce. He also commented on education and training, recruitment and retention challenges, on grading, recognition and reward um, measures, and on continuing um, professional development. His assessment was that senior managers were um, distracted and disempowered, and he expressed concerns about the emphasis on risk assessment and risk management, and often short-term target setting interventions. He commented on the organisation of services, with a focus on, uh, focus on specialist teams and the associated handover of children and between those teams. He also commented on how statutory children's services engaged the voluntary and community sector, on a competitive and um, contractual basis and one of his key recommendations was a, a reset away from um, protection activity and towards um, greater family support and he didn't mean by that that we don't need to protect children absolutely some children do need to, to be protected but we also need to better support um, families he describes family support as the golden thread and he advocated for more practical help um, and for what he described as longer-term befriending um, alongside skilled, short-term, time-limited, targeted professional interventions. He also advocated for families with similar experiences supporting each other and for services to be more embedded um, within communities. In concluding, Professor Jones said um, that his clear and firm view was that there is a children's social care crisis in Northern Ireland, which is systemic and endemic, and by that he meant that it spans all of Northern Ireland and is long-standing. He emphasised that in his view it was not caused by individual failings, but by the current children's social care structures, systems and processes across the region. His view is that it needs to be addressed um, by changes in governance, organisational arrangements and a reset of the focus to deliver on the requirements of the Children Order. He considered that it does not need um, a fundamental change in the primary um, statutory framework. He also emphasised um, the need for um, the crisis to be tackled with pace and not allowed to um, drift and he set a fairly ambitious um, timetable culminating in the, in the delivery of one of his key recommendations, which was a, a new Children and Families ALB um, by April um, 2026. The review report published on the 21st of um, June um, of last year, and it um, makes 53 re recommendations. And for consultation purposes, the department placed the 53 recommendations into one of five um, categories. So the first group of recommendations we categorised as guiding um, principles. And they include recommendations relating to proceeding at pace and without drift or delay, the need to consult, engage and involve children and families in decision making, the need to provide more help for families, to avoid privatisation of children's social care and to recognise um, the value of the contribution made by foster carers in Northern Ireland. The second group of recommendations relate to service improvement. And there are recommendations relating to the development of new services, to providing better and different services, the need for um, a service reset towards family support, and there are recommendations specific to the Sure Start programme and to a number of regional facilities in Northern Ireland. The third group um, related to how services are organised and the governance around them. A family and children's ALB and a minister for children are within um, this group. 
They also relate to how the department is organised, the relationship between the department and statutory children's um, services, and between statutory children's services and, and the voluntary and community sector. They also include a recommendation um, around budgets, um, multi-professional agency frontline teams and internal team structures. And this group of recommendations also includes a recommendation relating to the Encompass um, computer system. The fourth group um, are workforce um, related. Um, there's recommendations relating to grading and banding structures, post-qualifying development programmes, skills mix within teams, recruitment processes, um, the focus on retention, a trainee social work role and qualification route. And the fifth and final group uh, <coughs> um, um, include an annual conference and a recommendation um, to make decisions and to have actions initiated within a period of six months. Before I turn to um, what um, uh, will happen next in terms of the review um, report and its recommendations, um, given Professor Jones' emphasis on acting um, at pace and without drift and delay, I'd like to take um, committee through um, give you a bit more information on the Children's Services um, Reform Programme, and I think it was referred to by Peter Toogood when he met with the committee a number of um, weeks um, ago. Um, the programme was established by the Department in April 2023, um, and that was a few months before the review report um, uh, was published. At that stage, we knew what um, Professor Jones was finding and um, what he was um, thinking, and we very helpfully kept both the Minister and the Permanent Secretary um, informed throughout um, the review. The reform programme is overseen by a programme board, which includes, among its membership, senior leaders in um, social care within the department, um, within trusts and other departmental ALBs, including the Public Health Agency, um, RQIA, the Northern Ireland Social Care Council and, and the Children's Court Guardian um, Agency. The Departments of Education and Justice are also represented on the um, programme, as is um, uh, trade union side. <coughs> Um, we're in the process of expanding the membership of um, uh, the voluntary community sector um, on the programme. Um, we've just gone through a process that has been led um, by NICFA on our, on our behalf. The department is also in discussion with the Reimagine Children's Collective, which is a group of leading voluntary and community sector organisations which have shown leadership by responding to the challenge from the review that all of us need to work together and collaborate around implementation um, of the review. There are nine um, uh, work streams um, within um, the programme, and I can give members um, more information um, about that. In addition, um, the Reimagine Children's Collective have agreed um, to the establishment of a further work stream, which will focus on the relationship between the voluntary and community sector and, uh, and statutory children's services and on working in partnership with the um, department in line with the partnership agreement and uh, on an agreed action plan. As reference, some of the challenges faced by children's social care services are workforce related, with some teams experiencing high levels of vacancy. A significant programme of work relating to workforce is ongoing, some of it under the Children's Social Care Services Strategic Reform Programme, and some led um, by the Social Work Workforce Review Implementation um, Board, and the Chief Social Worker um, can take members through the progress and, and achievements that have been made um, to date, um, and what more is planned in, in workforce terms. Work is also um, progressing in relation to the development and implementation of policy, both to support um, strands of reform work and wider government strategy like the, um, ch the child care strategy or uh, in response to pressing child protection needs. That includes implementation of the Adoption and Children Act, implementation of the Looked After Children Strategy, a planned review of minimum standards for child minding and daycare and a programme of work um, relating to child criminal exploitation. So I want to return to the um, review um, now. So we consulted on the review recommendations between September and December last year, and we received 134 um, responses. In terms of some of the headlines um, from consultation, um, there was overwhelming um, support um, for a reset and greater focus and attention based <coughs> on family um, support. 83% of respondents also agreed with the recommendation to expand Sure Start geographically. <coughs> Um, although a smaller, um, a much more smaller majority, around 57%, supported an expansion um, in age range. There was significant support for multi-agency, multi-professional frontline um, teams, with more than two-thirds supporting rearranging um, team structures um, within children's services. 
69% agreed um, that a Minister for Children and Families would help to give political um, leadership and focus um, to the attentions of the Children's Services Cooperation Act and to champion children and families um, within government in Northern Ireland. 60% of respondents were supportive of, uh, supportive of the ALB, um, with this rising <coughs> to around 66% in the responses from organisations. A, sig a significant number, around 77%, agreed that action needs to be taken to stabilise the workforce. An equally significant number, around 75%, um, agreed that there um, were advantages um, to reintroducing a trainee scheme for social work. <coughs> there was strong support for recommendations categorised by the Department as guiding principles and also for um, the recommendation around an annual um, conference. More limited um, support was um, given to recommendations um, relating to very specific service models like the um, Mockingbird um, family um, model, which is a, a model of operating within um, foster care, and some very highly specialist um, services with large numbers of um, those who responded either being undecided or not answering um, the question. And based on, based on some of the comments that um, we received in consultation, it's our assessment that respondents didn't feel able to respond on issues that um, they were not familiar with or knew um, very little um, about. Um, there was strong disagreement to the department's position on um, the Encompass computer system, um, so the department rejected that um, recommendation, uh, although um, members may be aware that since consultation the, there has been a decision made by um, the department to delay implementation of Encompass within um, children's services by around two years and that's to enable um, additional functionality um, to be added um, to that um, system. <coughs> in terms of what will happen next and by when, we're in the process of developing advice um, for the Minister based on our consideration of the responses to consultation, and we hope to get that um, advice to the Minister um, within, a, within a number of weeks. We're also um, engaging with other departments on recommendations um, and responses relevant to those recommendations um, um, that are relevant to recommendations um, for those um, departments, and we're also working um, pr with professional officers across the, the department, including <coughs> in SPPG. <coughs> Um, when the Minister has decided on the way forward, um, we'll publish the consultation report, um, which will set out what will happen um, next. And we will, of course, keep the um, committee and the Assembly um, fully informed when decisions are made and in advance of the publication of the consultation um, report. Um, that's um, me finished by way of an opening statement. Very happy to take any questions that, that members have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eilish. Um, and I suppose then we'll put, we will have a lot of questions coming out of that. Some of them may have been answered in, in your your opening statement. I think, I mean, I think that the, the review by Professor Jones has been excellent, and, and it's really good to see it happening. But as as he has alluded to, and as you have said, we need to see that happening at pace. Um, and I think the key point is that for many of the children and young people who are now currently um, engaging with services or engaged with services, it will be too late for them, which is, is, is disappointing. So we have to make sure that we are getting to the, 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 the greatest number of, of children and young people um, as quickly as we can, but obviously wanting to do that right. So that, and that is so important. Um, I suppose the first thing I want to ask, if, and you may not be able, you mentioned there about the consultation re re report. Is there any time frame on when we can expect that? Because I know I know that will inform then where we go next. So the, the intention is to try and get the advice to the minister within the next couple of weeks. So the, the analysis has been done, mm -hmm. and we're formulating um, advice based on that analysis. So the analysis, sorry, the advice will take account of what people said in response to um, consultation. It will also take account of the extent to which the recommendations will address the problems that we know um, exist um, within um, the um, current um, system. Um, also need to take account of things like um, cost and, and, and funding, although the department was very clear in the consultation paper that um, accepting a recommendation um, will not um, be determined um, by the availability of funding. However, it might actually um, determine how quickly mm -hmm. and we can do some of what needs absolutely needs to be done so if we get advice to the minister within the next couple of weeks um a few weeks maybe for the minister to make his final um decisions that enables us then to publish the um consultation um report um and and begin the process then of of, of implementation 
Okay, no, thank you. Um, just, I suppose, on some of the points you'd raised then, workforce is, is what we've talked about across every uh, element, whether it's health, education, wh- wh- you know, it, it's, the same, it's the same issue right across, but particularly around children's services. Um, and a number of weeks ago, we had the chief executives of the trusts in, and one of the probably really frightening statistics that we heard was that some social work teams and children's services are operating at less than 50% of what they should be, which is frightening. Um, because, as you've said in, in your, your, your briefing, Eilish, the, the re- number of referrals are increasing, but we don't have the capacity to meet those. I think even in terms of the numbers of allocated, unallocated cases um, is, is really stark. And, and I think we need to remember that each of those cases is a child or a young person or family. Um, so these aren't just numbers on a page, these are actual people's lives. Um, and how that impacts on them is something that will carry on throughout their life if we don't get it at the right time. So that in, in itself, I think workforce is probably one of the key issues coming out of this if we want to try and tackle all of the things that we that the report um, has, has identified. So just in, in relation to that, um, you know, where, where you're seeing the gaps, what is there, is there work ongoing between all departments then to, to discuss how we tackle? Because it's one of the things I think that we, we are very aware of is childcare is a barrier to, to workforce for many um, and across many of the, the roles in the workforce is predominantly female. So childcare is obviously an executive priority. So are there discussions there on a cross departmental basis around how we tackle those workforce issues? So, I mean, there's a significant programme of work um, ongoing, a, a lot of it led by Anya as um, chief um, social worker. I mean, we have brought the Department of Education and Justice into the reform programme, you know, for that reason. So some of those cross-departmental um, discussions can um, take um, place. Um, Anya, do you want to set out um, for um, members some of what you're doing in terms of um, workforce? Yeah, certainly. Um, so... I mean, workforce pressure, as you've said, it is the single most important issue facing um, both social work and social care services and children. Um, both workforces are under enormous strain um, to do with vacancy rates, but also, uh, as Eilish has referred to, increased demand. And um, we see various drivers of increased social care demand um, in, in relation to, to poverty, complexity of need, um, and indeed, stresses and strains elsewhere in the system uh, as well um, and there's no doubt that a lack of early intervention preventive services is a factor as well then driving referral uh, into into children's services um, we do have an extensive program of workforce reform underway um, which includes a, a range of issues um, that, w- that we're tackling there's short term medium and longer term actions um, We did a comprehensive social work workforce review which completed in 2022 and following that and to implement the recommendations we established a social work workforce implementation board and that board has representation from professional bodies for social work, trade union side, all of the trusts and the major other employers of social work in Northern Ireland which would be education um, and and justice. so uh, the aim of the board is to provide sort of leadership and accountability for the development and stabilisation of the social work workforce. Um, and despite the fact that the picture is still very concerning, we, we have made significant achievements um, and we need, we need to build on those further. We, we recognise that there are no very immediate fixes to workforce um, and that it will be a programme of incremental improvement. Um, but to date, we have been successful in ending all agency social work use in June 2023, and we, um, you know, that 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 was a program that ran over, you know, a year in terms of preparing for that. Um, it, um, it's been very successful in stabilising the workforce. We now need to grow the workforce on, on top mm-hmm. of that, but that that stabilisation provided a really important base. Um, we were very pleased that um, we recruited um, almost 200 agency social workers into either trust permanent or trust bank contracts um, during that exercise. Um, 
They also created a fast track route into trusts for June 2023's uh, newly qualified social workers. And we intend to repeat that in 2024 and 2025. We've, we've just launched actually the, the, the sort of fast track uh, platform for, for this year's students coming out. Um, and we were successful in getting about 220 of the newly qualified cohort into social work in the trusts between sort of July, August, September, which which was much much faster than we have achieved previously, and having taken the agency factor out of it, it did mean then that that newly, the newly qualified social workers were committing to 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 permanent posts and in particular committing to building those relationships that are at the core of of social work. Um, We've also other achievements that we've, we have a learning and improvement strategy for social work from 2019 to 2027. So that's in place and being implemented. And we also established an open university work based route into social work. And that is targeting experienced social care workers and trusts um, to allow them the opportunity to, to go into social work. And then we also have just newly launched a, a social work uh, supervision policy to support practitioners in their role and we see that as key to you know the our retention efforts for for, for social work uh, and the addressing the issues that we know exist in terms of social work well-being um so th those are the those are the reforms achieved to date um in terms of our our plans for this year um we are working our way through. we've conducted a review of the various pathways into social work training um, and arising from that then we're, we're, we're mapping out a, a sort of five to ten year plan for pathways what the particular routes are where we should uh, concentrate our efforts um, we also um, hope to grow the number of social work training places as, as funding allows we, we have identified a very clear need for increased um, training places. Um, members may be aware that uh, social work um, training places were reduced to 260 from 300 in 2011 as an austerity measure. And there's no doubt that we are seeing the, the impact of, of that now. Um, we are working on an evidence base to understand what best su supports social workers and, and looking at the, those factors in particular. And we hope to sort of issue fairly comprehensive guidance about about the the right sort of targeted support for social work. Um, we, we will be working on that this year and hope to have that in place, you know, in roughly nine to twelve months' time. Um, drawing on some of the recommendations that Professor Jones made in his um, um, in his report, we will be building that into. We're working on career pathway guidance within social work, which will look at a whole range of training, qualification, where that fits in, um, and particularly how we support people in key jobs. And thinking in particular about first line managers who, you know, have a particularly difficult and challenging role to play. Um, we are also develop apart from the guidance. We are developing a range of very practical supports in and around um, coaching uh, and mentoring. Um, uh, so, so initiatives that are targeted towards social work well-being and promoting resilience, although we always do need to be careful that, you know, that yes, individual staff resilience is an important factor, but actually that needs to be supported by the, the organisational supports as well. The other big piece of work that we're currently working on is about establishing an evidence base for safer staffing in social work. Um, and that's in preparation for forthcoming legislation. So developing the tools and the models now, we're working with social work academics to build that evidence base. Um, and a, I suppose, again, it's not just about the numbers in that. It's also about the whole range of systems and support that supports safer staffing. Um, so that's another big, a key area, um, a key area for this year's work plan. Okay, thank you, uh, Anya. And I suppose just to clarify, interest, some of it came through the fast track social work. Uh,
course I graduated in 2011 so I know just how difficult it is even to get on that course so it's really good to see that you're expanding pathways out because I know there's so many people would really want to go down that route and it's not always the easiest to get into so that's encouraging um, I've just, I'm just going to touch on one other area and then I'll open up because um, we, are, we are really tight for time but um, I suppose the, the, the reimagining collective the children's collective has been excellent and that collaborative working I think has shown just the potential of the community voluntary sector um, and how important that is and, and even in terms of you know, the, the sharing of the workload where, where social work teams and others haven't been you know because of capacity issues there's often then there's an overspill where the community voluntary sector are often picking that up and um, whether they have a capacity or not or if it's in their remit they I feel they always do go above and beyond and that's right across the board in terms of community voluntary sector but I'm very conscious and I meet with a lot of community voluntary sector groups not just in terms of children's services but right across um, the whole sector and I feel that the the procurement um, model at the minute is making it really really challenging for where, where groups could be coming together working collaboratively com complementing each other and the statutory frameworks um, but they're they're nearly having to be they're nearly competing with each other in terms of funding so I think going forward we, we've seen how that works really really well um, and it's all about ensuring we're getting the best outcomes for children young people and families um, that early intervention piece that you've talked about is so important here because that's that's how we ensure that these children aren't ending up on child protection registers or ending up in care use I mean with 4,000 children in care of January you know really shocking figures so how do, is there any discussion I suppose firstly um, around reviewing the you know how how funding is allocated how procurement is is done I know that's that's probably in, in, in engagement with the Department of Finance as well um, and how we can ensure that it's not one 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 or the other how do we there's a place for everybody that's kind of how I see it I think every every organization brings something different to the table and we should be um, utilizing that as, as best we can because that will indeed support the services but all, but uh, ultimately achieve the, the best outcomes for our children and young people so, I mean like you I really welcome what has been done um, by the reimagine um, collective and I think it's a really good example of leadership and I think it is um, rising to the challenge that Ray Jones set for all of us you know, because he did say that we do need to work together and not in a competitive um, way um, either um, the department Peter too good and I have met a number of times now with the um, collective um, one of the last discussions that we had was around how we do actually work um, in partnership and, and the partnership yeah. uh, uh, and the collective put together a very good um, paper setting out um, how um, that might actually happen so that they have developed a draft and um, partnership ag agreement for example and associated with, with that they've also um, put in place um, a, a, an initial or a draft um, action plan which we discussed the last time um, that we um, met and we have agreed to establish another work stream of the reform program that will specifically um, look at um, recommendation 47 so Ray Jones said that we need to be working in partnership and and move away from that that that, that purchasing contractual relationship that we have and um, with the voluntary and community sector that work stream of the reform program will I think will be the vehicle for us um, to do that and one of the actions within the action plan dra drafted um, by um, the collective is about us starting the process of looking at how we fund um, the voluntary and community um, sector you know so you know is procurement the best um, route the only route a necessary um, route um, to purchase um, services from the voluntary and community sector we will look at all of that and in, 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 uh, through that um, through that work stream of the um, reform um, program we're meeting again with the collective I think at the end of April um, to agree the terms of reference um, for that work stream of the um, reform program okay thank you Yash. Um Linda thank you um, I suppose just first of all to say that I'm glad you are here but we will want to hear obviously more whenever whenever we know what's happening next um, and I am very conscious, obviously, that we had the, the group of young people in, in the room and their representatives, which is so important. And I think, finally, through Ray Jones' report, because it's something that, through the policing board and, and the assembly, for almost 10 years now, I've been trying to say the young people are the people that can tell us 
what what how they're going to have the best outcomes and finally we're getting to that point and i'm not saying nothing was ever happening in that space but not enough was happening in that in that particular space and i think that it, it's very difficult to know how you get good outcomes without asking the people who have the actual outcomes and I suppose just on the back of, of your own question chair around those different pathways because one of the other things that i've had serious concerns about is and it feeds into the mixed skills as well is that h- how far are we going to widen that out because the people who will best and i was going to use the word engage but i'm thinking about this way we've been talking no young person says i'm going to engage with somebody they say, i'm going to talk to them i'm going to tell them you know they don't say so i suppose it's it's even changing wrong language but the people who do work with them know their language they get them they understand them and a much much better than I will and I'm not going to say than you will because some of you probably have worked in that sphere and have worked with young people and very successfully and I know that there are outstanding social workers out there I was at the event in Dungannon a number of months ago it was brilliant it was it was the best example of how to do this and how to do it right but how do we do more of that how do we how do we get more of those people and those people who are working with young people the people who work in youth services, the people who work in the community voluntary sector, get them into these roles and have them directly working with these young people. The people that the young the young people can identify with and the families can identify with because very often it depends on who goes into a home, what the outcome will be. That, and that's the truth of it. We, we all know that. And could I go into a home and have the best outcome? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I don't understand the complexities of what's going on in that house or what's going on in that family. So how do we how do we get better? How do we do do that better? We've we've already done some of it. Um, so we have, for example, um, <coughs> peripatetic teams now um, that work with our children's homes, and peripatetic teams are multidiscipline multidisciplinary. Include some youth workers, um, for example, um, who work with young people um, in in homes. Linda, I think we, do, we need to do more of it. And again, Ray Jones made that point um, in the um, review. I think we do need to introduce greater skills mix, um, not only within our children's um, homes, um, but also um, within our w- w- within the team um, structures. That's, that's going to be partly necessary because I don't think we're going to be able to recruit all of the social workers mm-hmm. that we need um, to recruit to be able to meet the, the needs that we have to um, make. Some of that again has already um, started. So um, I knew you're going through a process at, at the minute of, of, of scoping what exists, um, etc. Do you want to say something about that? Yes, yeah, so, so there's a couple of things I would say. I absolutely agree with you know the emphasis on, on engagement um, and although not to be called engagement, but you know the, the, the workings that we're very clearly directed by young people and what they're telling us that they need and they want. And um, the Office of Social Services, which I lead, um, recently published a, a document on co-production in social work. And that is very much, um, the emphasis there is very much on um, how we uh, work with a variety of uh, people who use services to truly let them lead us and guide us in terms of what's needed as well. So we're very conscious of the need for that practice emphasis in, in social work, uh, and that's very, very much something that you know I would be encouraging in general in terms of social work practice, specifically in relation to skills mix. We, we, we are looking at skills mix uh, and there's no doubt that some of the impetus comes from our difficulties with, um, with, with social work vacancies. But I would say the greater emphasis is actually on what skills <coughs> do young people need. Um, so looking very much at you know, whether there are other skill sets or knowledge sets or experience that would actually um, a, be very helpful in providing a high quality service to children and young people. Um, we have um, we have a project underway that is uh, looking at <coughs> safer staffing in children's homes in particular uh, and that is not just about safer staffing it's looking very closely at um, what what skills and experienced um, you know, do staff need to have to give the children the best sort of outcomes, life experiences that that we can have. So that's very much, it's really the first time we've we've tackled this in terms of trying to come up with definite recommendations about 
uh, the, the, the sort of staffing of a children's, a children's home. As Eilish alluded to, we, we, we know less about the children's social care workforce, um, perhaps, than we do about the adult social care workforce, and we're aware of that. Um, it's also a slightly more, um, uh, you know, there's been growth in children's social care roles, um, but they also vary quite considerably. So we have, I think we've just received our last returns into a children's scope and care, children's social care scoping exercise, which is looking at the range of roles we have, what training people have, what qualifications, what are they bring into that, and then that will inform uh, a 10 year uh, social care workforce strategy um, and, and that's work that is very much in this year's work plan. So, so the, those issues are very, you know, we're, we're very alive to them uh, and, and bringing them into all of the workforce reform that we're doing. Okay, I have two other questions um, and I'm going to be brief as I can possibly be. The first one is around the allowances for foster carers, and this is not about money, this is about being, a, I'm, I'm thinking particularly around kinship care, because if, if children are in a home where poverty is an issue, <coughs> the chances that the kinship care is not going to be a situation where poverty is an issue as well are pretty slim. So, I mean, currently our foster care allowances are well behind where, where they are in other parts. And I'm wondering, is there is there any, um, review of that happening, is there any notion that we'll be able to improve that going forward? I, ju I just hate the idea that children in foster care are suffering in poverty. Do you know, they've already left a difficult circumstance and are going into an equally, if not more difficult circumstance because somebody is taking those children in knowing I can't afford to do this, but I have to. So one of the um, nine reform work streams that I referred to in my opening remarks, Linda, um, is a fostering um, work stream um, and it will look at um, a fostering payment model as a priority. Um, so that work, um, uh, the workstream is planning to undertake um, this year, alongside you know putting other supports in for um, foster carers um, too. Um, and we, we can provide committee with more information about that as as that work um, develops. But I just want to assure you that a fostering workstream exists and that a payment model. Um, that will take account of, of how foster carers are paid in other parts of um, the UK. That will be a, a priority for that, um, for that work stream this year. I really appreciate that. Um, and then just finally, just to say, first of all, I, I am, do want to come back to you, probably on a separate occasion, just around that um, policing and, and social care, particularly care homes, but that's a, a separate issue. Just in terms of the success criteria then for the Children's Social Care Reform Programme, in terms of improving the system and the outcomes for children and young people, how is the progress been monitored and measured? Okay, so and again, that, again, that was one of the challenges that the Children's Services, um, sorry, the, the Reimagine um, yeah. Children's Collective, um, I think, set for us within um, the um, department. Now, we're all working within the framework of a, of a children's strategy, mm -hmm. um, which itself identifies outcomes that we want to um, deliver for children and young people for looked after children. And we have a looked after children's strategy, which identifies all of the same outcomes that we are intending um, to deliver um, for looked after children. So the aim of that strategy is to improve well-being, which is measured in exactly the same way as we measure well-being for any other um, child. I think the thing that will set us apart is how we get there. You know, so there will be specific actions that we will need to take to deliver those outcomes for looked after children um, in the same way that we want them delivered for any other um, child. So I think, Linda, that's the framework that we are working um, within. We might need very specific indicators for, for, for that group of um, young um, people and very specific actions um, to ensure that we actually get there within a reasonable time frame. Thank you, Chair. Arlea. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I know that we're really tight for time, Chair, so I'm just going to ask the, the one question to the panel. Thanks very much for all of your opening remarks. Um, but my question is around, um, in terms of the reform work that's taken place overall in children's services, how we are linking in the mental health action plan and the mental health strategy. So, you know, no matter what you're reading through in terms of your briefing paper, the Ray Jones, all the different reports that have been done, um, the issues of childhood disability, particularly mental health, um, addiction issues, 
run throughout, you know, whether it's looked after children, children ending up in these um, positions through poverty or whatever the reasons are, but those trends run throughout. Um, so I'm just, I would be a wee bit concerned that I think it's really important that this work is very closely joined up to the work <coughs> of the the 10 year mental health strategy and the mental health action plan. Otherwise, I think it's going to be a missed opportunity if we're, you know, going on a course with the 10 year mental health strategy and then trying to do the Ray Jones recommendation. It's how we're joining the two up. So, Elish, I know the, the new programme board actually has a work stream around children's um, disability, I think it is. Indeed, yeah. So, would the, would the mental health aspect fall under that? And is there any active engagement then that's happening at the minute between? your team and the team that are involved in the mental health strategy. Thank you. Okay, so, so the Children's Services Reform Programme is one of three reform programmes. Um, the second um, relates to adult social care, so there's a collaborative forum has been established um, for that, and then there is um, the mental health um, reform programme under um, the um, strategy. Peter Toogood is the SRO for all of those, so the, all of that falls within um, Peter's um, group within um, the department. Uh, I suppose he will be <coughs> the link um, between all of those, all of those different reform programmes and uh, and a measure or a means of ensuring that all of those things are connected um, to um, each other. So I'm quite confident mm -hmm. that under Peter's under Peter's leadership, um, they will. And be connected together, and you're quite right. I mean, mental health is a huge problem mm -hmm. um, within um, the looked after um, population in particular. So it, yeah. it will absolutely um, feature as an issue. Um, you know, under the looked after children strategy, for example, mm -hmm. we did invest um, in the emotional um, health and well-being and um, framework and education um, uh, th through the looked after children strategy. So um, it's a it's a, a, an acknowledgement, I suppose, that mental health. Is an issue, um, but I am quite confident that under Peter Toogood's leadership, all of the connections that need to be made will be made. Well, that's good. And if I could just maybe add that yep. uh, professional social work officers sit on all three of those boards as well. Very good. Um, so you, you know we have a role in in joining things up as well. And, and I, I suppose I would particularly say in relation to workforce and the skills that the workforce have to tackle mental health or disability issues. Um, we have dedicated professional officers uh, working on those issues, but also I, I lead the, the workforce reform across mental health, adult social care and children's social care. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm certainly joining them up. Because yeah. well, it will be important, I think, to have that sort yes. of unified voice when it comes to if there is any you know um, funding streams coming out of the mental health strategy or the action plan, that this this area of work is getting some benefit out of that, definitely, it would be important. So it's good to know you are across all of that. Thank you. Thank you, Orlia and Ula. Um, thank you, Chair, and um, thank you for coming today. Um, and I just want to say, I know Voipik had left, but I, I wanted to welcome them and, and include youth. We have a number of young people with us today who have had, had experience in care um, and who are now experts in what should be the way of looking after them because the 4,000 children that we mention here are children who have as equal value and a legitimate future as you or I or my children. So it's really important that we, that we do listen to them. And some of them have... Um, provided me with questions that they wanted to ask um, and in particular one unfortunately that, that um, ha had left already was why is a young person who lives in either in Derry or Belfast getting different services and access than what their peers are getting right across Northern Ireland because they simply live in a different area um, and whenever you're a 16, 14 or, or 12 year old um, it doesn't matter about bureaucracy all it matters is about it's your life and your future that you're dealing with um, so why when we have such <clears throat> a crucial issue that is a young person's life and future, are they not getting the same service no matter where they live in Northern Ireland? I suppose my, my first comment in response to that is that all of the trusts are working within the, sa within the same legislative framework. So, you know, technically you should be doing broadly similar um, things. Um, not all trusts have the same experiences currently in terms of workforce is, is one point that I would uh, make. So um, we've got much higher um, rates of vacancy, for example, within Belfast than, than we would have um, in, in the Western um, Trust. It's one explanation. Um, Noel, I'm not saying that it's um, the explanation at all. Um, I think it's why Ray Jones made the recommendation around 
a single ALB. Um, and I think that was prompted in part by what young people um, said. Certainly, when I met with young people as part of um, the consultation exercise, that was a message that came through loud and clear. Why, is, why, 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 why does somebody in the West receive something different from somebody um, in Belfast? It's why Ray recommended an ALB to ensure that we have greater consistency of service and um, provision and um, everybody doing broadly similar things within a legislative framework um, that actually facilitates that. And I think um, one thing that is particularly then is frustrating is that we have we have had the Ray Jones report um, who has made multiple recommendations, many recommendations and some that can be implemented rather quickly, others long term. But one in particular, you know, that the children's um, services directorate, you know, we are here, in, you know, in terms of feedback, whether it's in the chamber or, or whether it's through written questions, that there doesn't seem to be the kind of desire for that to take place. Um, and I don't know whether that's the case, if you can provide any further clarity, because we, we've had a review, but now we're hearing that there's more work streams to find out more things, there's more reviews to find out more things, but we have recommendations on, on the best way forward, so why don't we just implement them? So of, of the 53 recommendations that Ray made, um, and we made this clear in consultation, I think there were around 28 of them that we said um, we should be implementing now. And it, we said either we'll implement them wholly, implement some of them in part, or, or uh, some of them with some level um, of adjustment. So a significant number of those recommendations, we um, have started the process of implementing them. Some of them have already been located within um, the um, reform program. So a couple of examples. Um, smaller children's homes, for example, is one of Ray's recommendations. That's being considered by the placement capacity um, uh, work stream. We've got a, a work stream around family support, so we're looking at how we better support families through the family um, support um, work stream. But there, there are 27, sorry, 28 um, in, that, uh, in that group. Now, we still ask questions about them in consultation because we did want to hear if anybody had anything else that they wanted to say in relation to those 28. But um, I just want to assure you that we're not, we're not doing nothing. We are absolutely doing quite a lot, um, actually, including implementing um, 28 of the recommendations that Ray uh, Ray made. I mean, there was a further 20 that we didn't take any position on um, at all and, and, and ask questions on those 20 um, also within um, w within the consultation and document. But some of the big recommendations are in that group. And I, and I respect that some of those um, will be for a ministerial decision to take but um, and, and ensure that this, this committee will keep up the pressure. And I think at some point we have to look at the reality of at some point does this committee need to go through those recommendations and look at has this been implemented, has this been rejected, approved, rejected, implemented, because I think only by keeping up this pace we can then say to the young people who have come here today and the many others that actually we have listened to you, um, the department has listened to you and we're doing, we are doing what's best for you. And another one of the questions that not, um, some of the young people have in common is with regards to the transition um, out of children's services into supported living and the fact that there is no um, guarantee of accommodation after that two years, that it could be just an adult hostel. Um, has there, is there any ongoing work between the Department of Communities with um, specified ring-fenced um, housing or allocations for those who are leaving care and a supported accommodation? So we, we, we already have what, what are called jointly commissioned arrangements in place um, with between Health and Social Care Trusts and the Northern Ireland Housing Executive. So um, there are quite a considerable number of supported accommodation projects in place um, across um, the North um, and they are supported, funded jointly by Health and Social Care Trusts and, uh, and NIHE. I do think we need to do more of it, um, Nola. Um, you know, the pressure on placements is really quite considerable um, uh, within care, and then that extends obviously to aftercare um, too. So um, some of it, again, is already done, but there is a lot more um, to be um, done, including, I think, developing other accommodation options um, too. So again, within trust, some of what they're having to do is to develop other um, accommodation options and one of the responsibilities from it for the department then is to put some kind of standards framework um, around that to make absolutely certain that um, that accommodation is provi being provided to the same standard um, across the board, going back to your, 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 your original um, question.
I think that's something worthwhile keeping in, in touch about and certainly exploring with it. I, I think in terms of the consultation report too, um, hopefully we will set out very clearly what has been done, where it has been done, what more remains um, to be done and where, um, and where that will get done um, too. If I could just add, Neil, it, it, it might be helpful just in, to go back to your first question um, that, you know, about regional variation. Um, you know, there are regular meetings with uh, the exec directors of social work um, in the trusts, and, and one of the you know the conversations that we have regularly is about best practice examples elsewhere. So, so the, there are certainly a, there there are certainly efforts to share and learn from each other. The children's directors I, I know meet every Friday morning, um, and and a, a part of that will also be about. You know, so again, that that learning from from good practice elsewhere, sharing ideas, and, and indeed working jointly on many many initiatives. So while we recognise, you know, there there is an issue with ver regional variation. There's also good good work going on in terms of, um, I suppose, learning from each other, and and that's a feature of the work streams under the Strategic Reform Board as well. In, in terms then, you'd mentioned about that regional variation and we hear this as well with respite services for children, but also anyone who remains in any young person who is in a hospital setting for more is it than three months is comes under the social care network and there has to be that um, engagement with families and stuff. But, um, you know, what is the department doing regarding your statutory duty to actually ensure that children who are in place in those long term settings are moved out of it? So we've recently, you know, we understand that there, there are multiple JRs um, from external organisations against the Department of Health, the Trusts, to try and get those young people out of those care centres, the Ivy Centre for one in particular. Five years, children, five years, they have been waiting to be moved within the community. And how, what's going on here? You know, whenever uh, there's already been um, a judicial review, not in the department's favour, why why have any decisions not been made to actually ensure that there are young people, whether they're in the Ivy Centre, whether they're in Beechcroft, whether they're in Woodlands and have had bail conditions already met but not moved back into the community because social care system is failing them without getting them a system? What, what's happening here? There's, there seems to be there's too much going on that is just impacting negatively on the lives of these young people. I mean, it's it, and this impacts on their future and on their parents' future, their siblings, it, everyone. I mean, I, I, I mean, I do acknowledge that um, there have been delayed discharges from IV, and unfortunately, it has led um, some cases in, in, into court. Um, and that, I mean, it was one of the reasons why Children with a Disability Strategic Framework then was um, developed. I mean, it will look at things like transitions and everything. Um, Nula and again, there's a, a work stream built um, around that, as Orlea has already um, acknowledged. You know, it, it has happened. Um, it shouldn't have happened, um, but hopefully, by way of um, the, the work that is planned, um, we will prevent it um, happening um, again. And we've also got work ongoing um, across care and justice um, too that isn't partly intended to prevent that movement between. Um, care and justice and to ensure that children are, are, are in secure care, for example, for very limited um, periods um, of time, that, you know, that for the shortest time um, possible. We've had a whole programme around that. And I recognise this difficult, and that is my last question, but and, and I'm not trying to be deliberately difficult, it's just every single one of those cases is a young person with the future, um, and whenever you hear that there are work streams, but, you know, it's, it's almost like you know, do it, that it is worth doing it, spending the, the money, the funding, because it costs more not to do it, both financially, ethically, morally, um, in terms of what it means for, for that young person. And, and I, again, I'm not doing it deliberately to be difficult, but I think it is just important on, on all to, to really progress the issues to ensure that those young people are where they should be. I mean, I think the programme is just an attempt at 
pulling things together that need to be pulled um, together in the, um, one place. Again, back to the comment made by earlier, you know, I mean, are you in, in, are you in considering mental health um, issues when you're when you're looking at these other things? So it is just a means of pulling things together. I think, and we'll stand on fa or, or fall on the actions that we um, take now um, through um, that programme. So I think there's an onus on us um, now to be able to demonstrate that we are actually taking concrete actions and that those are actions them. are making um, a difference. So. Mm -hmm. That's something we can continue then to get an update on these programmes yeah, as we move yeah. through. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Danny. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, yeah, just to follow on just from a, a, a couple of the, um, the things that were raised there, um, 28 uh, recommendations out of 50, 53 um, that you've already uh, started implementing since June last year. Um, so there's obviously a programme of work that is ongoing despite um, significant workforce pressures. So you've obviously implemented um, a timetable of changes. Three quick questions just around that. Um, you've obviously identified some low-hanging fruit, some quick changes that you could do right away. Um, just wondering what your actions, what the priorities for action are. You've obviously undertaken already a couple of, well, quite a few changes, more than half of the recommendations have already been started to have been implemented. Um, and what do you think would make the most tangible benefit? Have you identified anything in particular that would um, significantly improve the outcomes here? So I, I, for me, there's three things, um, and this is all reflected in Ray Jones's um, report. The first one is family support. I just do think we need to get better at um, supporting um, families to prevent children being referred to statutory and um, children's services to need a child protection plan to, to be taken um, into care. So I, I do genuinely think that we need to be able um, to do that. Now, some of that is going to require funding mm -hmm. um, because the, the you know, children will st are still in care, the care places need to be funded, etc. Et so, but for me, that, that would be one of the key things I think that um, we need to be able to tackle and tackle well. I think the second one is workforce. We are going to have to stabilise um, our workforce, introduce greater skills mix um, into our workforce. And I, I think the third thing then is um, placements. Um, you know, we've got the highest number of children in care since the children order um, was implemented. Um, we need to ensure that we've got good placements um, for those children so we need we, we need to develop um, what we what, what we're currently um, offering and we are we are doing um, some um, of that so I do think smaller children's homes are necessary one of the, one of the things we're looking at is um, I've already said it um, putting a standards framework around um, supported um, accommodation so trusts are now developing their own bespoke um, placements and um, for young people maybe using existing trust properties or using lease um, properties um, I think we need to develop that for, further but also ensure that there is a proper standards framework and um, built around it and the other thing that we're looking at is multi-site children's homes and that was that was building on something that happened during the pandemic so what we what we did during the pandemic was to permit what we called annexing so when children needed to self-isolate for example or where children were going through long periods of um, lockdown, maybe needed um, a bit of time out um, somewhere, we allowed um, our trust to develop annex and arrangements and, and that actually did work quite work quite well, um, although there were still quite some important um, lessons to be learned um, from it. We want to translate that into what we're now calling multi-site um, children's homes, where you would have a core home with, with a number of different um, buildings I suppose um, attached to it all, all all registered in one place have one registered um, manager and, and it enables trust then to manage the their population across um, <coughs> that, that, that multi-site but again we need to build rules um, around how that um, should actually um, operate so those three things um, Danny family support sorting the workforce and I think um, sorting um, placement and um, availability for the, the number of children that we've got currently in care. One last quick question, if you don't mind. Um, the amount of children in care grew by 37% in the last 10 years. The 10 year period, yeah. Is that trend still going up? What What is that trend at the minute? Yeah, so the, the, num the number is continuing um, to um, increase. So by, in January of this year, the number the number grew um, again um, to 3,970. It's mm -hmm. the point that I'm making. Um, I do think we need to stop that um, tied, and I think the way you're going 
to do that is to enable families to stay um, together. Mm -hmm. Some families need to be supported to enable them um, to stay um, together. So I just think I think we need to do more um, of that. Otherwise, that number is going to continue to uh, to grow, and 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 the pressures on placements will continue um, to grow. Um, we, we we definitely need to do something um, about that, and and more quickly than that. It is a shocking trajectory. It is. It, it really it is. is. Yeah. OK, thank you. Alan Robinson. Yeah, sorry, um, my question regarding postcode, postcode lottery for child care services has been already answered. OK, thank you. Thank you. Diane? Yeah, no, um, Danny very helpfully asked the question I was going to ask about how to prioritise some of the, the recommendations within the report. Um, just a, an, an, an observation and maybe some... You talk in quite broad terms about how to what you want to prioritise and, and I accept that that's sort of, but we will have to get down to particular actions and, and in particular areas because the report does highlight that different trusts have different ways of dealing with things and different policies and you know the 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 what a, what a young person can expect in different areas can be very very different so just drilling down into that further and, and I think your 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 priorities around family support workforce and placement are are probably you know absolutely crack on but um I, I just think that we then need to to drill down into that and get some kind of plan as to how you intend to do that um, rather than, you know, we want to increase the workforce, we want to increase the skills of the workforce. When I talk to um, young social workers, many of them feel poorly supported um, and in, thrown into very difficult situations very quickly um, where they are very worried about their own um, position in relation to that. They're worried about the young person or child they're supporting. Um, and um, so, you know, increasing skills and so on. But I'd, I'd just like to see, will you be developing a plan to put those three priorities into operation? And if so, can we see the plan whenever? And I, I accept that you're taking a lot of this to the minister as well. And his stamp will then be upon it. And I'll be interested to see that. But I just think we need, we need to get to the stage of of actually planning it out and how, how we would do that. So there, there, there is a plan um, under um, the reform programme that, that looks like that. There's a considerable number of actions um, in it. I think what we now need to do, and this is what Peter Tugut has asked all of the work stream chairs um, to do, is to focus on three pretty concrete actions that need to take place um, more quickly than not um, to deliver um, change that cannot um, wait, and and and, have, and we're, have, we're in the each, process of each, doing that. Each of those, have you identified those three? So in each of those, so each each of the chairs, our, our co-chairs, has, has been asked um, to do that. Um, so hopefully within a sh relatively short period of time, that's information that we should be able to provide um, to the um, committee um, across those nine those nine work streams. Yeah, because it'll be interesting to see how those priorities. Um, pan out and how in six months or whatever we can measure how the work has been going on in relation to those priorities which I think is probably what the role of the committee mm -hmm. actually is um, but um, thank you um, just finally finally in terms of fostering I've had some fairly traumatic will live with me for quite a while um, incidents of constituency issues of um, a lack of availability of foster carers um, and I know that the Southern Trust have done I have stickers on my door and all the rest of about the importance of fostering. Is it going to be a specific campaign around fostering or are you there, there are, there, we, there we did something about a year yeah, ago. Yeah, I mean, I think there are ongoing fostering and campaigns. I mean, that, that happens every mm -hmm. every year. I mean, I think the foster care 
popula- foster care population yes. has remained pretty stable um, over Demand the course of the growing. last year, but that's not good enough. Um, we've got more children in care, yeah. we need more yeah. um, foster carers. Again, uh, within that fostering work stream, I'm sorry to keep harking um, back to it, but one of that that's again one of the things that the, they will be um, looking at, um, recruitment and retention of um, foster carers. Yeah. Okay, members, no one else has indicated. I think that's been very good and it is something we're going to pick up as we go along, Ellis, and obviously if there's more, if there's updates coming to the committee, we can um, we can take that on board as well. Certainly for me, and you've said it, and one of the points there to Danny is the really important the importance on the early intervention um, to try and ensure that we're then actually bringing that trajectory down um, by getting the support at the right time, so children aren't going into care in the first place, and families are getting the support they need to keep them together because that's that's our ultimate priority in in all of this. So. Um, and that's certainly what's coming out very strongly of Professor Jones' report. So, look, thank you all. That was really, really good. And I'm sure we'll, we'll see you again very soon. Okay. Okay, members, thank you. Um, our just, I suppose, coming out of, of that, we um, have suggested for Professor Jones to come to the committee as well. So, um, we'll ask the clerk to, to get a date for, for that. And also, um, we talked about engaging with stakeholders and young people as well. Um, so I think it would be important. <coughs> board. Sure. Yeah. Can I ask, um, if possible, when might be timely then for when Ray Jones is with us as well, if we actually do get an update of which recommendations are implemented, mm -hmm. um, in terms of of um, the department and yeah. where they're at, I think. Yeah, you mean? I yeah. think that is helpful. I mean, we I know we can find right. out by all of us submitting written questions all the time. But um, um, the way that we do it, you know, in our in our other committees and in, in policing, you, they literally list accepted, rejected, mm -hmm. um, yeah. after a period of time, and there are so many within departments that you don't you don't hear about unless MLAs are asking written questions. But in this issue, given its 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 importance and yeah. Yeah, I think that would be useful if we could maybe write well, to the department. If then. members are content, the the officials indicated that they're um, putting up a report to the minister for agreement. And if we haven't got that in time, then to get a, a written update on which yeah. recommendations are being yeah. mm -hmm. um, accepted or rejected, taken forward. Mm -hmm. um, but hopefully that report through to the Minister will be published within time, which will provide a bit more detail. Okay. I just add to that, um, Chair, but I, I think that because even whenever that report's brought to the Minister, and even whenever they decide what recommendations they're going to take forward, it's then the points that were made by others that it's it's how you actually then track that the recommendations yeah. are being implemented. So even I know Keith previously in the last committee, health committee, um, you know, even if we get you know like bi monthly reports or you know some form of regular yeah. mm -hmm. written update to the committee, you know, Action formally, log. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, using the health board, I'll be really. I yeah, where off. it's where it's at, and I mean, so we agree a like regular written yeah. updates on yes, progress. Yes, whatever's practical. You know, I'm not saying weekly reports, but even yeah. if it's bi monthly or whatever, so we can yeah, see the, yeah. the the progress. Yeah. Just a quick suggestion: you might want to say to them they could look at how the police board do that yes. that action log. It, it's it's really easy to understand. Yeah. You know, this action still open on under. As an example, I'm not saying they'll do it yeah. exactly like that. I'm not suggesting that for one minute because it just won't yeah. necessarily be as straightforward. But just as an example of how I've used before for stuff for my own work because it actually is. Yeah, so it's 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 just about it's nearly like a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. So it's each recommendation, what where it's at, is it open, is it closed, is it what? So something to that effect. I think if they're able to to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, item number seven then is correspondence. If we can refer members to page four one four of your pack. Um, and there's just a couple of items um, I want to draw your attention to. Page 128 of the tabled papers pack is the Health Minister's reply relating to the junior doctors' pay dispute. Um, and you will be aware that we are meeting the junior doctors' committee on the 26th of Mar sorry, Mar the April. Is. Or the minister is, sorry. Um, and they're also then coming to committee yeah. then. It's, if it, I it's early it. May, so it is. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> Um, the, there also is a reply from the Finance Minister regarding the pay dispute at page 132 of your table papers and it advises that there hasn't been any engagement with the Health Minister on this issue um, and at present there are no further opportunities for additional 
allocations for the 2023-24 uh, period. I'm having a nightmare here <laughs> trying to get words out today. It's that time of the day, isn't it? Um, also, there's your reply from RKIA regarding the deceased patients review um, at page 135 of your table papers. Are members happy enough to forward this to the individuals who had been in contact in relation yeah. to this? Yep. Um, and we also have a brief in from RKIA in the forward work programme. So we'll hopefully have an opportunity then to, to raise this with them directly. Um, members then at page 150 of your table papers pack is from the Windsor Framework um, Committee to the Minister of Health for Health, providing a link to the written evidence from the British Dental Association regarding the mercury regulations. Um, are we happy enough to note the correspondence? On this? <laughs> Have you got your table? Did you get your table papers? Uh, yeah, but they're not. Um, well, they're not coming up quickly. Oh, I've read okay. them, but they're yeah, just not. <laughs> yeah, and the link it was difficult yeah. to work, but I think yeah. we're going to get that sent yeah. separately mm -hmm. as well, just for anybody wants to. Read uh, are we happy enough to note that for yeah. now? Yeah. Um, are we? Are members content to note the replies received and the actions and the remaining correspondence as listed on the memo at tab seven of your pack? Could I ask, Chair, that we? Um, have a, a bit of a, a, a look or it says that chair deputy chair to consider um the children's health coalition and the the, the cost of uh, having a child in hospital um i i i declare an interest in that i know very well um the parents of a child now deceased um but who who fronted up the report um but I do think that this is something that we might want to consider, mm -hmm. um, and and look at in a in a you know, and allow them to come and present to the committee. I'd be very keen to see them do that. Yeah, okay. on, Linda. Just two quick points. There actually was a really really good event around, around that specific issue, but I think probably most members weren't their health spokespeople or there or, or yeah. there on the committee. So. Um, it probably would be beneficial. Just on the the, the stuff around the deceased patients, I, I mean, I'm very conscious that I wasn't on the last committee, and therefore, although I was at events where the, where the families spoke at different number of different meetings, and I just think it'd be worthwhile as a committee us kind of trying to establish where are things at now, what what's happening, um, in I'm th and I'm thinking more from the family's perspective. So you know, getting getting stuff through and what's been done by RTIA and all is grand, but I don't I don't know how the families feel about that report, and I mean I don't know if they know yet themselves either. So I'm not saying we do that immediately. In fact, we have so much on. I don't want it to be squeezed in somewhere. Yeah. But if at some point we could engage somewhere along the line, it can even be done in an informal setting. And maybe to be honest with you, mm -hmm. it would be much more yeah. appropriate to do it in an informal setting because. This is extremely emotive. It's very difficult. Like one of the Tuesdays for these families. We um, if we could do something informal with with those families and try and get a, a sense of, of where they're at and what their expectations are of us as well in yeah. terms of trying to represent them and navigate. Certainly, them. have a look. And I know we've had a number of individuals write in to yeah. the committee. Um, we, we'll have a look to see if there's any groups or if members are aware of any particular groups. Um, but certainly, we've had a number of individuals. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right in the committee, but um, so should we maybe we can have a I think and get back, we'll have a yeah. think and then get back to you with, yeah. with if you're aware yeah. of any okay. individuals or, or groups sort of representing, um, um, I'll, then I'll, we I'll can the we can certainly have a I look and get that scheduled. No yeah, yeah, okay, um, okay, members. Then the item number eight is the draft forward work program. Um, so just if you could look. To take you to the three documents at tab eight of your pack and the draft forward work program at page 590. Uh, members, a visit as discussed previously, a visit to the Marie Curie Hospice in Belfast has been arranged for 12 noon on Thursday, the 11th of April, so it's before our next committee meeting. So uh, that's open to everyone um, who wishes to attend and it will be followed with an invite. Um, an informal meeting has also been confirmed with May Ireland on the 22nd of April which is a Monday and unconscious is the sitting day, um, but if people could keep in mind, I think it's for two o'clock yeah. in Stormont and, and an invite will go out in relation to that as well. 
Are members happy to note the briefings then as set out in the four book programme? Yeah. Um, are there any other items of business anyone wishes to raise? Okay, thank you, members. Members, the next meeting is Thursday, the 11th of April, stay fortnight at 2 pm. It's still three weeks, sorry, yes. uh, in, in this room. So thank you all. And hopefully, we'll get some break over the recess. Thank you. <coughs> Thank <laughs> 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 <laughs>